Welcome to Trivial Debates. Once again, here we are for another episode of Trivial Debates. This is our second episode that we have done. Um, we got uh, Halen all the way from Youngstown, Ohio, Jim Edelston. Say hi, Jim. Hey, what's up? Okay, we got the former host of this from last episode. We got Dave Mater. Hey, uh, I'm at Super Dave Mater on Twitter. We have the always whimsical Jody Simpson. Whimsical. Oh, I yeah, like that. It makes me sound your, classy. That's your ass. All right. And I am your host, Jeff Mater. I've taken over the reins for this week so that Dave can argue and debate his... And work the audio equipment. Work the audio equipment. <laughs> and and re-dive re into this after uh, you know Jim had a little bit of an internet snap. It was all Jim's fault. It, it, it was, and, you know, <laughs> and we didn't hit the record. It sounded like he was Honestly, in Honestly, Jim, you need better internet. If it wouldn't have screwed up, they wouldn't have, or you guys wouldn't have looked. So, so it, maybe it was a good thing. Okay, so as I said, this is our second episode, but you can now reach us on iTunes. Uh, Ooh, we are also what are we, do we have part of we the have dynasty. A Facebook group as well. We have a Facebook page now, so like us on Facebook, uh, subscribe to us on iTunes, and also uh, we have a, well, you can you can you can watch the episodes on YouTube. There's a YouTube version which you can find on my channel on YouTube at Super Dave Mater, and. Uh, Okay. Yes, we should we should connect with Lava Life and is that still around? Okay, match.com. Match.com. Lava Life, no, I think they they're yeah, are they dead now? Didn't right. Brooks Crookston from Dragons and didn't he own that or something? Yeah, I think so. I think yeah. so yeah. 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 Anyway. Okay, so we what we have here is five categories plus a wild card, which can be any one of those five categories. So technically we have six categories. Uh, they range from movies, television, music, sports, history, and wild card. And once you know everyone gets the bait of one of those six questions, then we move into a speed round with only two contestants, two guardians, two champions to fight for their uh, movies, their TV shows, their their historical uh, characters, Wh whatever they are debating. That is what they are. And whoever wins the most rounds wins the game. Right. Whoever wins the most round wins the game. Nice. Moves, but we move. You know the first. The, the final two after the, the main round, which is six rounds, then we move into a much quicker round. We're going to try and get this wrapped up within an hour to an hour it's and a half. Gonna so. right it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I don't believe that. That happened. is a cloud dream. <laughs> we're only three minutes in. We're almost through the intro. It's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> we want this is the intro. It should be like 10 seconds. As long as nobody argues with Jody, we'll be good. All right. Good luck with that. Okay. So we will move to the movie round and I'm going to throw a curveball. I'm going Ooh. to make Jim argue first. Yay. So so just so freshen it up, Jim, argue for what is the best film based on a true story? Well, I went out of the box since uh, I guess my first choice was already taken, but uh, I picked 21. Uh, it was based on a book called Bringing Down the House by uh, Ben Mesrich and uh, they obviously changed some of the names of the movie itself. You know, Ben Campbell was the main star of the movie. But uh, a bunch of unknowns as far as the young, young actors. Uh, you had Kevin Spacey, which is friggin' amazing, one of the best actors of all time. And uh, Lawrence Fishburne. I mean, who, who doesn't want to see Morpheus in every movie that they're in? But, um, you know, the movie starts out with uh, basically inter Ben's interviewing for a position for Harvard Medical School and basically doesn't have any money to pay for it, and the only way that he's going to get it is to tell the most interesting story of how he got to where he is, which is the actual story of 21 itself. So um, Ben tells the story of basically the MIT Blackjack team, if you know anything about that. If you don't, it was a uh, group of MIT students, uh, brilliant. They uh, basically came up with a formula for counting cards in Vegas, the high-low option, and uh, made millions and billions of dollars. And the reason I do like the, the, the movie, you know, even though um, it's exaggerated from the book itself, um, is, you know, basically, you know, it's exciting. It's not your typical uh, history movie or anything based on, uh, you know, tell true stories or based on a true story. You know, you could even probably watch it if you didn't know anything about the MIT crew. You could watch it and be like, wow, that was a good movie. You probably never even realized it was it was a true story. That's how, you know, insane the whole idea seems, which I think is good. It's very entertaining. 
you know, his action throughout the whole thing and, you know, pretty suspenseful, you know, through through it and how he gets involved and how they, they become the friction between him and uh, Kevin Spacey, which is his professor. And uh, like I said, you know, just making millions of dollars. And it really was one of the first movies, too, I mean, that made nerds cool, I guess. You know, it was uh, MIT students glorified finally, you know, in, you know, this insane tale that, again, like I said, it is. You didn't know it was a true story. You could, you know, walk out of the theater or watch it and go and wow, that's a good story, and never realize it. It was based on on the story of him and his friends. Okay, so we will move on to our next uh, debater, Dave Mater, and what have you chosen? Well, I picked maybe the greatest film ever made, Goodfellas. Martin Scorsese, 1990. The uh, the life and times of Henry Hill in his in his uh, tenure with the Lucchese crime family of New York City, uh, spanning from 1955 to 1980, best on the best selling book Wise Guy by Nicholas Pileggi, who co wrote the screenplay with Martin Scorsese to bring it to the big screen. Uh, definitely considered one of the greatest films of all time, not just in the crime genre but in general. Uh, it's culturally, culturally significant. It was nominated for six Academy Awards the year it came out, uh, going against uh, that blockbuster Dances with Wolves, uh, which uh, stole a lot of the awards that year, you know, purely based off uh, America's love of Kevin Costner. I'm going I'm to use my first bullshit response, which is that movie was bullshit. Yeah, it was bullshit. Right. Dances so, with Wolves. I have to get at least five in on every session, so that's going to be my first one to use. <clears throat> It was not only not the best <laughs> film of that year, it's, just, it's, it's not even a very good movie, period. But The, God, uh, the Godfather Part 3 was also out that year. Uh, I feel like it split a lot of the Academy's vote on the mobster thing. And having two big uh, mafia movies out the same year may have had an effect. Not to mention the cast, Ray Liotta, um, uh, Joe Pesci, who won uh, Best Supporting Actor. Uh, as well as uh, Robert De Niro and a whole slew of other great actors who who brought that film to life that really puts you in that time and place. The music of that movie is amazing. It puts you in each era very well. Um, significantly, the use of Layla uh, in that sequence that talking about the, the murders of all of the, um, the Lufthansa heist gang and how that all played out. Um, and, uh, you know, not to mention Martin Scorsese was recognized as the best director uh, in, in numerous film critics and groups for that mil- film. The long tracking shot that, that starts on the streets in the 1960s moves into the Copacabana uh, basement and then the kitchen and into the comedy club itself. Uh, working that all in, there's not one dull moment in Goodfellas. It is, uh, you really feel like you're living this guy's life right from the time he's watching those gangsters out his front door the time he becomes one and how he transitions afterwards and and that's really all there is to say about it it's maybe one of the best films ever it is it is is definitely the best uh film based on a true story ever made okay jody uh, try to be that those are big words there (laughs) all right well i picked apollo 13 and the reason why i picked it was because not only is it great entertainment but it also tells us exactly the struggle that these guys went through uh, during that particular mission uh, to the moon, which was obviously a failure, probably one of one of history's greatest failures of all time. But yet, it was also a win, you know. So it's 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 both. Um, you know, you have an all-star cast there. You have Tom Hanks, you have Kevin Bacon, uh, Gary Sinise, and of course the lovable Bill Paxton, um, which I believe when he wasn't chasing tornadoes, he liked to blast off into space. I think those are the two things that he did. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Past that, I also think that um, the movie itself, excellent direction, uh, visually stunning movie. Um, You know, keep in mind, even if you look at this movie now on Blu-ray, it is still a fantastic looking movie. When you experience it, I remember experiencing that movie for the first time in the theater, and it was... It was like nothing else. It was like it was like when you first saw Jurassic Park. It was a, it was one of those monumental times when you said you saw the CG dinosaurs, which now look terrible. But you know what I mean. But at there the was time, that, yeah. yeah, at the time you're like phenomenal, and you know you're seeing these guys recreating all these all these famous camera angles of you know he camera angle you know angle for angle recreated 
you know, the launch, uh, various other things that happened, the, the splashdown, same idea. Very little archival footage was used. It was almost all recreated using, you know, old school methodology. You know, we're talking Star Wars methodology with miniatures, stuff like that. Um, and, you know, nice little effects. Um, overall, the story itself is a very powerful story. I think it's, it's a story of triumph as well as failure. And it's one of those movies that you sit there and at the end of the movie, you feel great for humankind. It's not a U.S. event. It's not a, it's not a Canadian event. It was truly a world event. We had three human beings off of our planet that had to get home. And that was, it was, it, it gripped everybody and the movie captured that. It captured the essence of what it was for humanity to not only fail, but to also win. I thought it was just a very powerful movie. Roger Ebert said, Exactly, and I quote, this is a powerful story, one of your best films, told with great clarity and remarkable technical detail. Okay, so if I had a chalice, I would right now, slam it down. I feel right like now. the two bigger contenders right now are Apollo 13 and Goodfellas, but I need to hear from Jim why 21 is better than Goodfellas. Why? One word, fucking rat. That's two words. <laughs> <laughs> You're already you're already gone. <laughs> like you're done now. Well, I just want I want to I want to hear if he can make a compelling case, then maybe I will consider him. Who's Rat? The movie. Well, you guys aren't Italian. You don't understand. The movie was glorified a, a, a snitch. It was, you know. Right. What the fact that Goodfellas uh, is is about a guy who who. Yeah, he snitched on his family. Yeah. You don't yeah. do that shit, man. What does that have to do with being the best film based on a true story? Because why would you make a story out of that? Because it's amazing. They made showgirls. The fascination with the mafia in American culture is 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 well documented. Uh, the Godfather being sort of that the first gateway into that. But this was not just like like the Godfather was a fiction based on a whole bunch of other things. This was true, and this right, was the but first. There's so time. many other great mob stories that you can tell. You know, don't get me wrong, Scorsese's amazing, but. You know, it, it really was just a movie about a guy that was a rat. Bottom line. Why is you know, 21, 21 better? You know, it's a bunch of students, kids, whatever, that, that <laughs> take off on this wild journey that is unimaginable and rips the man off, you know, for millions and millions of dollars. Okay, but I'm still not getting into anything of why 21 is better. I'm getting why Goodfellas isn't as good now, but I need to know why 21 was good because essentially at the end of the movie of 21... Um, he snitches, does he not? So I'm not really getting your, your, your point. <laughs> that just debunks everything you said. Because well, they walked away with money, though. They... <clears throat> but he turned over. He like he screwed Kevin Spacey. He screwed the man, which was very similar to what happened to. And then he ended fellas. up trying to be president. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah, trying to be president. <laughs> well, I'm not that far in. Okay, so all right, this season is, season three. Other than the long tracking shots, why? Wh how does Goodfellas even compare to Apollo thirteen in effects? In effects, it's yeah. not. Well, it's not an effects based movie. Mm -hmm. uh, it's based on a real life, a uh, real person's life and how they saw events, mm -hmm. and they you know they took the best parts of that story. That book, uh, Wise Guy, is long. Um, it, there it. In terms of it being a great film, what the actors themselves brought to that, mm -hmm. uh, initially on all the auditions, everybody was like it, improving and kind of putting their own take on it. Mm -hmm. And th uh, then Scorsese recorded these, had them transcripted. He built these into the script them itself. Um, he then went, um, you know, through with uh, with with Henry Hill, who served as a technical consultant for the film, and was also able to. Um, where, where, where am I going with this? <laughs> I don't know where you're going with this, but it sounds like you're losing. <laughs> All right, Jody, uh, why, how does uh, Apollo 13 even compare with Goodfellas in story? In story? Well, it's a story, as I said previously, that is an important story for humanity, okay? Yeah, Mr. Snitch, who ended up in a ditch or whatever, whatever. Um, it's... Apollo 13 is a story that has to be told. It has to be told from a global scale. You know, we're talking a movie that now, don't get me wrong, Goodfellas, fantastic movie. And honestly, it kind of hurts me to even argue against it because I love it. Great movie. But it's, it's a movie that we could have lived without where I feel retelling the story of Apollo 13 is a requirement. Okay, it, it, is, it shows us our humanity. Whereas snitches, not so much, right? And it's 
you know, I'm not saying that it wasn't an important, uh, you know, Goodfellas being based on an important story, because I think it is still important. You can learn a lot from it. Uh, but Apollo 13 was a movie that not only is completely historically accurate, as far as I can tell, and as far as all the critics have said, um, you know, but it's, it's a telling for the ages. I sat down and watched that with my son. My son is, you know, he's now 11, but at the time we watched it when he was nine. He was compelled by it. And this is a movie that was about, you know, a, um, you know, obviously a decade that is far past his generation. Um, but, you know, it, he, he was compelled by it. And he, at the end of the movie, I asked him what he thought. And he said basically exactly what I said. It's about losing but winning. It, it's, it is okay to fail as long as you keep trying to win. Um, you know, failure wasn't an option for those guys. And they made sure they didn't take that as being as being the option. The option was they are going to get home. It's that simple. And everybody who helped them out made that happen. Everybody knows that story already. <coughs> everybody really, knew. My son didn't know that story at all. Well, everybody, no at the time it. that the film was released. Fair enough. Everybody, you know, generally that was alive at the time, except, except for maybe very small except children. Except for the eight-year-old children that were, uh, you know, at that time period. You know, yeah, as well, well as I, I would have been, what, what, what year is that movie? It's after Forrest Gump, which yeah. is It was definitely after Forrest Gump. It's 95, yeah. maybe. It was around the 95 area. Yeah, I, I got to agree with Dave on that one. It, it's a story. It's a, don't get me wrong. It's impactful. It's like the Titanic. Right. And, you know, it's all about the humanity. Titanic was a piece of shit. They're, they're to get home. Point, point yeah. given. Point, point <laughs> Dave, I think both are very uh, just fantastic movies based on true stories. It is. It shows, it shows one man's life. It's a true story about something amazing. That you know, people fantasize about that shows New York and what its culture was and why it was the way it was and what it became. Um, and Apollo 13 is really just a big screw up in 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 uh, fairness to it. Yeah, it's it's great that they got them home, but it's it's nothing. You know, I the movie is just filled with cliches and moments that um, are just a little. Maybe that's the point. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think he's right. <laughs> I think there's some sort of brotherly bias here. Ah, uh, no, I can't, I can't not go against Goodfellas. Of course, I, I got the best movie. All right, I'm on the board. Woo! On the It'll board. be the only one he gets tonight. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we move on to the television section, category, whatever you want to call it. I thought I picked another good... Uh, question for this. Originally I was going to do a slightly different uh, question, but I thought I would uh, take it a different way, and I went with, what is the best first season of a TV drama? Originally I was going to do Which what was, was the... hard as hell, by the way. Right. Just to, just I to struggled. Out. I had a few different candidates. And I had I... tons of candidates, and I just couldn't I couldn't come to grips with the first season of any of them, really. That's why I picked, the most part. That's why I picked it, because originally I was going to pick the, the what is the best final season of a TV drama. Oh, that would have been easy. But I felt like that was much easier um, for everybody, good. whereas I, I wanted everyone to just kind of think about this one. So right, You can say it's a great series, but you really got to think about the first season. What The first season, exactly. too, is so important for setting mood, setting tone, and that's going to go into, into a lot of my decision here of um, who wins this point, because any one of you can win this point. I think all for all these seasons are fantastic. All right, who goes first? Uh, I think we're going to start with Jody this time. Me? All right, I get to go first. I picked Breaking Bad, and I'll tell you why. Breaking Bad in the first season, number one, seven episodes only. Okay, so very, very short season one. Okay, we're talking, you know, Walking Dead short. Okay, and Walking Dead first season was fantastic, in my opinion as well. Okay, but I didn't really class Walking Dead as being totally a drama. Okay, so I kind of wanted to go as true drama as I could. Wait, well, how would you classify it? I think it's more of a suspenseful kind of drama slash... Um, Thriller? Yeah know if I want to go thriller and I don't know if I, I, if there was something in between thriller and horror I would probably put it in there but I don't know what you'd call that maybe horror or something like that <laughs> uh, but you know trending now on Twitter <laughs> trending now you know hashtag horror all right excellent okay. let's, let's try to let's just link it to random shit too which will make yeah. it even more fun yeah. everyone's guys about Thor <laughs> what the hell is this about <laughs> Thor <laughs> Thor was in trouble um the, the reason why I really picked it was because within that one season, we got an idea of, you know, the character itself, you know, the bad decisions that he's going to have to make to support his family, to basically let, let the rain go on while he's gone. You know, he finds out he's terminal. 
you know, it finds out he's got to, you know, he's going to have to get some cash somehow. And, you know, he uses his you know, chemistry teaching skills to, uh, to better that. Um, is it a good decision? Hell no. And everybody who watches that show knows damn well it wasn't a good decision. And he gets on with, uh, what's his name? Jesse, I guess it was. Um, Pigman. Pigman, yeah. Uh, but the, um, you know, the, the main thing that I thought it was, we got really deep into the characters really quickly. Um, you know, we learned... Um, even his wife, we got you know a lot of intricate details from her even in the first season. Um, you know you could you could see, start to see the bond that was going uh, between the two main leads uh, right away. Okay, well within reason, you know maybe an episode or two in. You know, but it established the you know the turmoil that is going to end up being this guy's life, and it was it was a season that I thought when I got to the end of that season I thought well holy hell like I don't even know if I want to watch this anymore like it's so goddamn depressing you know but it had so much good good stuff in it like you know the acting in my, in my you know Brian Cranston fantastic um, what Aaron Paul I guess it yep. is the other one um, Aaron Paul you know also in my opinion you know guy I never knew about before this you know had no idea does have a history just I didn't know it um, you know and that's made me want to see some of the stuff that he's been in right and I think overall I think both the actors very strong performances for a TV series mm-hmm. um, but you also have for instance you know the um, you know what's his wife's name um, yeah, Skyler. Skyler yeah, yeah. Um, you know Skyler you, you start seeing how she's getting affected by his decisions even though she has no idea what's going on mm-hmm. and the effect is there and it's and it's a domino effect and whatnot when does she find out in that season that he has cancer. At what point? Oh, that's first oh. episode, is it not? Okay. Um, yeah, she she knows she about it. I think either that or like the beginning of the second one. Yeah, she's right. Like she's she knows, she knows right fairly away. right away, but yeah. she doesn't know obviously his activities. Right. right. Yeah. Like you know they you know he's working at the car wash. You know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That doesn't sure. happen until second season, I believe. Yeah. When she figures it out. when she actually figures out that he's you know cooking and stuff like that. Um, but it it in my opinion it I I thought that the character was. Um, it's believable. Mm-hmm. You know, this is a guy that if any one of us were in his situation, that might actually be something that we might do. You know what I mean? So it's relatable. The characters are all relatable to the most part, except for the overuse of the word bitch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but past that, um, you know, overall, I just thought it was a very strong performance by everybody. And it was one of those seasons that I thought when I got to the end of the season, yeah, I do want to continue. Um, whereas a lot of the seasons, you know, you find like the first like four episodes. Look at Sunday Anarchy, perfect example. The first four episodes in my opinion, were fairly terrible. But the series was fantastic. Correct. Yeah. Right? And, you know, it's it's the same thing that I felt with uh, Breaking Bad. And I don't want to hog up too much more time. So. I would just say also with Breaking Bad, like that first season, I think, well, like, we, your point is that it's short. And I think, like, with that whole season with uh, the two characters, that they, well, the one he has locked up in the basement, the other one uh, they yeah. kill, yeah. you know, I think you kind of see while the lights thing. start, <laughs> you know, he starts, you know, he ends up killing that guy in the basement spoilers. Yeah. And, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't seen season one yet, yeah. stop this podcast yeah. and go watch. Yeah, um, but you sort of, you sort of see that character, that singular character, start to go down a path, and you're like, oh, I'm interested. So that yeah, props yeah, yeah. it gives you a bit of a hook, and you know, on top of that, you know, you're talking the amount of material that they covered within the first seven episodes was, yeah. in my opinion, it was it was quite uh, quite a heavy amount. Yeah. Okay, so Jim, we're gonna go to you. What what's what show did you pick for your first season of a TV drama? I picked Dexter. Yeah, good choice. <laughs> this is over. <laughs> so uh, the main reason I picked Dexter was, um, you know, is uh, you know a little bit uh, out there as far as uh, what the show is about, and he's a blood splatter splatter analysis for the Miami PD, who is basically a serial killer because of these urges he has. I mean, it you know he's right in the own in their own house. He's seeing the crimes of people slip through the cracks of the justice system. You know, he lives by a code that his father taught him because, you know, as growing up, his father identified who, you know, Dexter did adopt, or he adopted Dexter from a crime scene that, you know, you find out later. But um, the Dexter character itself, even though he's a serial killer, you know, he's a good guy. He, he works for the police department. He always wants to do the right thing. Um, he might seem a little bit out there, you know, not um, as uh, socially inept as his sister is. You know, his, everybody loves his sister. He's a little bit awkward. You know, he has his uh, goofy friend. Uh, God, I can't remember his name. The Asian guy. Oh, um, I don't know. Nah, name's oh. slipping me right now, but I know who you're talking about. And uh, he's one of my favorite characters. can't remember his name, but, you know, just the fact that he's... Very memorable. You know... <laughs> 
has these urges and was trained and taught and brought up to the life of a code to do the right thing through it, you know, has a, a, a lust for, you know, blood, becomes a blood spatter analyst for the PD, you know, one of the, the best they have. I mean, he's really what's behind solving some of the crimes and the ones that slip through, he's got all the information for everything he needs. You know, it just grabs you right away, you know, from the first episode. You're like, huh? You know, and, and you start rooting for him. It's like, you know, who, who hasn't seen really fucked up shit on TV in the news or whatever else? I've been like, you know, eh, that's not justice or that guy got away with that. You know, somebody should do something about it. You know, it's it's the TV show that, that everybody, you know, could watch and be like, hey, this guy did something, even though it's very dark and he, he's very um, troubled. You, you love the character and you want to see, you know, who's next, what's going on. And, you know, he's right in the den with the police department. And there's only one guy, Stokes, who, uh, you know, even suspects that he's off and, you know, starts tracking him down to you know start thinking something's off he had no idea what but you know sitting with all these cops only one guy out of the whole thing even caught a whiff that there was something wrong with this guy so it just the the story's complex and, and uh you know takes so many twists turns a serial killer that you root for i mean it just it had everything right from the get-go to grab you and bring you in and keep going you know, Dexter's the one with the ice truck killer that that season, right? The first season. Yes, the very first season. Yep. Right. Okay. Who his sister gets involved with, and you know, you know, brings them together, and you know, ends up you find out later, you know, who who the ice truck killer is and why and how that's all tied together. But yeah, and even the later seasons tie right back into the, a lot of stuff that happened in the first season. Okay, so we will move on to Dave. And Dave, what do you pick? Well, I picked maybe one of the greatest shows of all time, certainly of of the last decade, Lost. You, sir, are smoking some hard crack. <laughs> no. Wow. <laughs> Jesus I think Dave Christ. Has the hardest Couldn't we have one. just picked, like, couldn't we have just picked Tom and Jerry cartoons? Like, <laughs> holy hell. Hold on, hold on. All right, let's hear him out. Let's it, hear him out. It's the hardest I'm going to tell you, okay, this show. Sell me. You're, I'm going to sell you. And, not, right, and you specifically, me. not the series as a whole. Yeah, the series had problems. But this first season, <laughs> That's a fucking the, there. the ending, which I stand by, but is extremely controversial. That's in the last season, okay? And everything that happens that. I wouldn't after know it was such a terrible show, I didn't get past that far. Well, if you if you can't, the first season finale uh, and anything beyond that w- w- is not in my argument here, okay. and it can't really be in any of yours. You can't no, talk about. No. I can talk about yeah, like the series as a whole maybe uh, was, was was watched by millions of people, and in all of our cases, that's true. Mm-hmm. But my first season um, delivered 25 fantastically crafted episodes. That pilot, the premise of the plane crash on a deserted island that has a science fiction mystery, <laughs> changed television. Oh, my <laughs> God. God. That first season, brought to us by J.J. Abrams and other, uh, you know, great sci-fi writers like Damon Lindelof. Now and that, doing the Star Wars. Now doing Star Wars and Damon Lindelof, who who did the. Which um, I can't tell if it's an upgrade or a downgrade. The leftovers, uh, as well as um, who's the new the, the guy Mark Goddard, who just got announced as the new writer director for Spider Man. Yes. He was a writer on Lost as well, and he wrote uh, an episode of this first season. This first season was nominated for twelve Primetime Emmy Awards including Outstanding Casting, uh, for uh, Outstanding Directing, Outstanding Drama Series, Outstanding Musical Composition. Terry O'Quinn and Naveen Andrews as John Locke and uh, Saeed, respectively, were both nominated for Outstanding Supporting Actor. J.J. Uh, uh, Abrams and the, uh, the creative staff were not only nominated for directing, but just for writing as well. And if you, uh, the ensemble cast brought an international flair to television that hadn't really been done on ABC or any of the major networks before that. ABC, the whitest network in the States. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's, that, that's the whole thing. Besides they, maybe Fox. <laughs> they, not only was it uh, an internationally diverse crew, they would do full episodes in Korean with subtitles. And they were just as good as any of the other Which episodes. Would totally make me watch it. Right. Yeah, um, you know, like the the episodes all established this huge ensemble cast and all their characters, and made you want to know the fuck out of every single one of them. Particularly Sawyer, John Locke, uh, Jack, Kate. Uh, it goes on and on. They were all, and how they all tied really together. Wild. The reveal late in the season that showed the Claire flashback, which showed the link between Jack and Claire, was was uh, you know. A, a huge shock and kind of was showing how these all these people were connected every one of these episodes was was compelling it was what made it one of the highest viewed shows ever and the ending with walt being dragged dragged off by the others and um 
uh, Harold Perrineau, who played Michael, screaming, Walt! Walt! And then, lost. <laughs> Dave, wow, that's, that's... Dave was very into this show. <laughs> very. Okay, so I think y'all made... We excellent. don't need to run a blue light on your DVD version, do we? Hmm. A little bit of a blue light there. Just when Saeed goes... Um, you know they blur, they they black, they burn these things because they you know when they were coming for Russo's baby they they they, they burn the, uh, the 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 black smoke right the pillar of black smoke right and they, that's how I knew they were coming and then it's like in the finale of that season he's like we will burn these with the black smoke and then they will know that we are coming. Wow, that's riveting. I, <laughs> <laughs> I think we know how to fuck with David Bramford. This year. <laughs> we definitely do, and that's what's gonna happen. I'll tell you right now. Okay. No, so I think hey, you, on a side note, Dave, wasn't the wasn't that the era when the, the writing strike happened too? Not season one, but season four. And it, it wasn't that, it wasn't until like season three or four. Season four, pretty sure, because that was the shortened season. No, season one took place between uh, September twenty second, two thousand four, and t- May twenty fifth, two thousand five. Nobody noticed but though, it, because it, they the series in general. That's I, I thought it was. There it was a lot of good series that, that that you know fell short because of the writer's strike. Yeah, Dexter, well, I think, uh, you know, didn't as much have to deal with that, did they? Because they were on Showtime, so they, right. you know, they were able to go. Um, as for, okay. Breaking Bad, obviously, was well past that point. Well past that, but, you know, in fairness to Dave, I think Lost was uh, one of the first shows in the O period where everyone really started to uh, analyze every, every little thing in the TV episode. And uh, I think all those things uh, have... Uh, you know, carried it's over to a Breaking Bad and a Dexter. So. It's a really big screw you to anybody with ADHD, that's for sure. It's really easy to write for shows that are about uh, just one guy and his day-to-day. You know, he goes to the store, maybe he uh, has to get a cup of coffee, he goes to take a shit, whatever. That's what Dexter and Breaking Bad are. Lost was about 20, like 20 interesting characters, compelling characters um, that, you know, forget about it. Like, you know, to, you, to channel Goodfellas. Like it had Lost was essentially a soap opera for science fiction. <laughs> it, was, it was it was terrible. It was like watching a bunch of shorts all the time. It was like watching a short film festival constantly. That's what it was to me. And and you know what? I, I understand where you're coming from and you know what, in all seriousness aside, very, very popular show. And I think they had massive ratings almost the entire the, time. The, the finale of season difference. one had twenty million viewers yeah i didn't i didn't bother to bring numbers because let's face it i didn't think i'd need them um i don't think that's what it should be uh but it shouldn't be about that anyway yeah it should be what show what first season really set the tone and i think right now jim has made the best argument of uh, i think dexter those first couple of um episodes really did set the tone and you know he didn't have to say much to get his point across because if you go back and you watch that first episode of dexter it it really sets you in that mood. I can't and get past Dexter's Dexter, sister, though. She's De- bloody annoying. Dexter is a gimmick. It's about a guy who mm-hmm. a serial killer who kills serial killers. It's it you know it's like and, and every episode is just like what fucked up way am I gonna kill this guy this week? That's all that show yeah, is. Yeah, but it's it, it is maybe a gimmick, but it's never been done before. Whereas Lost was just a rehash of Gilligan's Island. No, it's, it's no. reverse CSI. That's all it is. It's <laughs> it's it's we're gonna. Here's our serial killer. This is what he did. Let's see him evade now. You know, it's basically Grand Theft Auto just in a video format. Like it's, I that I can't. So much more than that. He he, his you know they investigated his crimes too, and he did everything to throw him off his track. And like I said, there was only one guy out of all the cops being in there. You know, the lion's den that even suspected him of being off. Does that take place in the first season? Yes. That's the black guy. What's that, his name? Yeah. Stokes? Stokes. 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 Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, and that first season of Dexter, it just has a lot. In fairness to Breaking Bad, I think Breaking Bad, if it was a little bit longer, would have been able to compete here. But I think Dexter overall had the best, strongest first season um, episode to episode. I think Lost... You know, you judge. Lost, I think it kind of <laughs> jumps around. I'm sorry. I'm going to give this point to Jim. Um on you right now. It bypasses me on the next one. I'm calling bullshit and I'm walking. This out. is bullshit. Dexter wasn't even the second best argument. After you know, it was it was probably breaking. It's not down. how long you make your arguments. <laughs> not only that, but the guy who had to argue it doesn't even show up. All he does is he shows up. He calls it in. 
Like he's some sort of executive or something. I phoned a friend. You, you know what? I, 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 Breaking Bad was my first choice, Yodi, and obviously it was it was gone. But see, <laughs> there's two people that agree here. I wanted to and give it the, to you, the but reason I, I struggle with Breaking Bad in the first place on picking it was I didn't start watching Breaking Bad until season four, and everybody's like it's the greatest ever. So I'm like I gotta watch this. But I think you even mentioned it. It takes like four episodes. Where before you're like, all right, I'm hooked. So, okay, I was explaining why I picked Dexter. I'm gonna say it real quick, and the reason is because I was struggling between Breaking Bad and Dexter, and the reason why I picked, I think, okay, I'll tell you why I didn't pick Lost because Lost jumps Shit. around a lot. It is a great first couple episodes. The pilot is amazing. The ending of Lost uh, of that first season is amazing. The middle is jumping around, and you're right. You made a good point that it's easy. Confidence, to, man. It is definitely easy. All the best, de- all the best cowboys have daddy There's issues. There's a couple of great episodes in the middle. I'm oh, not saying there God. isn't. I'm just saying the the overall first it's season. Young and the Restless in science fiction. That's all it is. <laughs> Why are we debating this? This is garbage. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if it was series, I, I wouldn't have picked Dexter because Dexter really jumps off the rails of later seasons. If you, this is true for I sure. Think over, uh, the reason I picked Dexter is I think Dexter's strongest season is the first season. But almost by far, and and not that Lost isn't, and Breaking Bad it certainly is not. So no. I couldn't pick it for that reason, just because I think Breaking Bad's weakest season. Breaking Bad season be, one doesn't even have Saul. I think the weakest exactly. season of Breaking Bad actually is probably the first season. Probably, but that 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 tells you how great that show is. But it, that wasn't the question. That wasn't the question. I and I, that's a, I was actually. But I still think the first season was good though. I was. I, I almost had to eliminate Breaking Bad almost right away because one in seven episodes, and so I had, was between Dexter and Lost, and I picked Dexter because I think overall that story is real concise, real tight. Just Jim didn't even really need to argue for it in, uh, like a lot because he made a lot of good points in his opening. Had a great pilot. I'm gonna have to drop it's bullshit set, again. I think it was a. I think it was a mercy point. Uh, it sounds like a mercy point. I don't to think me. so. <laughs> I don't think so. I think it, okay, uh, Jim. Um, I don't know how we can add in Dylan. <laughs> Hold on, let me see if I can add him. I guess. Okay, we'd like to welcome to the program Dylan Gonzalez. I don't think. Um, oh, so, wait, wait. Is that Dylan? Is that Dylan? Dylan, okay, Dylan. we're just starting the music round, Dylan. Okay, so we are okay. we're moving on to music. The question is, what is the greatest classic rock of, album of all time? Classic rock rock <laughs> album, rock, 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 Rochester. Um, is Dave able to answer this question? I don't think so. I know all about classic rock. He picked Dave. Lost last round, so we obviously <laughs> know where he is. He's fucking lost, is what he is. <laughs> I'm sorry, but Dave doesn't even didn't even know who Iron Maiden was. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I'm gonna have to fucking hit him, and I didn't want to, but I'm gonna have to plow him right in the face. Wait, before you answer, who was the band that you were listening to when I stayed with you guys? You were um, playing from your room, and I was like, "What the hell is that awful noise?" And you're that was like, Barney and Friends. <laughs> probably what it was. You know <laughs> me. Like some folk, like I don't know what you're talking. Oh. It was what? It was probably what he's going to argue for, Jim. Okay, well then, I'll remember the name if I hear it. But Okay. Right, so who's up first? Dave, I'm going first. My my pick is the band's album, The Band, also known as The Brown Album. Uh, Released in 1968-1969, uh, it was recorded in West Hollywood and New York City. It was the second album by The Band uh, after their debut uh, music from Big Pink. It is considered to be a, a musical masterpiece. It was coming off their success um, and establishing their own identity after being the uh, backing band to Bob Dylan during his electric um, revolution. Uh, this is a story, a, a musical story, that focuses on people, places, and traditions associated with older versions of Americana. Ironically, uh, the band is made up of four Canadians and an American. But it, it really balances that folksy music of uh, rural Ontario with, the, with that of the traditions of the Deep South, telling the stories of, um, you know, just sitting on your porch on a, on a, on a day, on like a, a day remembering your times that, that, that have come and gone. It has um, probably one of the, my favorite songs of all time, The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down, telling the story of the Civil War from the uh, perspective of Virgil Cain. 
uh, um, you know, a, 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 a southern, what do they call it, confederate soldier and what it really meant for the common man versus what it uh, meant in more historical terms and how it affected him and his family, uh, as well as up on Cripple Creek, Rockin' Chair, Rag Mama Rag, King Harvest to Shirley Come. These are some of the most classic uh, rock songs of all time. Uh, they are all in one album. It influenced uh, not just the American and Canadian population, but m other musicians of that time. They would listen to albums like the Brown album, the band, and the, you know George Harrison, Eric Clapton, Neil Diamond. They were all profoundly influenced by by this group and by this particular album. Okay, we will go to Jim. Wait, we don't have we don't do rebuttal. No, we, we let everybody go and do an intro, and then okay. there's a little okay. argument. Okay. So we'll go to Jim. What's the greatest classic rock album of all time? I, I kind of have to unplug my mic here for a second and see if this, okay. will, this will work here or not. Tell me if you guys can hear this. Can from right now. Can you guys hear that? <laughs> <laughs> like that shitty, awful old uh, GNR song? <laughs> See, look at that. Like, instantly identifiable by somebody that even said it was shitty. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just meant the quality. I actually like the song. Very C tonight, isn't he? Okay, so uh, hands down the best is there? introductory oh. album by a band is Apple okay. for Destruction, Guns N' Roses. Not classic. Hey, hey, Jim, what year was that made? Forty fucking years old. Yours is fucking shit. My grandparents listened to Dave. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about the classic rock era. We're not talking about the nineties. Okay. In Jim's defense, Guns N' Roses gets a lot of airplay on classic rock stations. Amen. They've pretty much fallen into the like the minutia of classic rock. Go on, Jim. Make your point. Okay, so not only was it the best introductory album of all time with over 18 million in sales, it sold over 28 million worldwide. Put aside the fact that Axl Rose is a dick, and everybody that likes it will fucking agree with that. Every single song on there was a hit. Every single one of them was identified. Nobody even had to sing to that one. Jody instantly knew what it was in three seconds. Oh, yeah. Guns N' Roses, hands down, were the epitome of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. They lived rock and roll. They were rock and roll. Big hair band, big hair band era. You know, whatever you want. You know, they fall into the metal genre or whatever. But you know, metal to me is something completely different. But they're considered heavy metal. Just you know, the whole LA scene at the time. You know, with with them. You know, Poison, Motley Crue, LA Guns. You know, on and on. That whole era spawned so many great rock bands and, and Guns N' Roses by far was the most identifiable most rock that you could get at that time I mean they were always on the news Axel was always getting in trouble you know they set so many standards raised the bar and that album itself just in general is still sells tremendously well you know week over week month over month if you still look at the, the sales numbers Okay. All right, Jody, why is your album the greatest classic rock album of all time? I'm just wondering if I missed the crack session before I showed up. <laughs> like, like, honestly, did you guys all just decide to shoot up at the same fucking time and then I showed up? Like, is that what happened here or what? That's well, for being late. And for what it's worth, I've been drinking, so no, no shooting up on my end. All right, fair you have, We haven't heard your answer yet. Yeah, but either way... Number one, I don't consider hair bands by any means classic rock, okay? But anyway, that being said, there is many, many options in this scenario. However, I went with our experienced Jimi Hendrix. Solid intro album. Solid, and I mean solid. Every track on that is, is a great track. Half of them only ended up being singles, but you know, you have a incredible mix of everything. Like, there's jazz influence in there, there's synthesized influence there, there's just straight hard rock influence going on, there's, you know, you have even bluegrass going on in that album. Like, it's it's a crazy album to listen to. It, it's almost like listening to, like, a modern day sampler from a, from a record label. But it's one guy experimenting, and that is really what that album is. It's all about making music that he a enjoyed and don't get me wrong the backup guys fantastic as well okay you have um solid drums on that on pretty much every track in there um very good accompaniment as well um you have a left-handed guitarist which was just not 
something to see. Yet he still played it upside down, which was just phenomenal when you think about it. He played the he played the instrument upside down instead of getting the one that was meshed for him, like you know, an actual left-handed guitar. He just played a right-handed guitar upside down. That's all he did, right? Fantastic to even see. Um, the every single song on that album was, as I said previously, it. It was an experience, and that that hence is the actual name of the album. Is are you experienced? Have you have you seen everything that can happen here? And I just think it was a solid album. And whenever I think classic rock, or whenever I hear one of those tunes, I always think classic rock, and I always groove to it. It doesn't matter who you are. You enjoy Foxy Lady, you know, like it's just, it's one of those songs. And yeah, of course, you know, they used it in Wayne's World and now new generations know what it is. But you know what? They still enjoy it, you know, and you have, you know, Purple Haze, you know, in my opinion, one of the most powerful uh, Vietnamish, um, you know, uh, you know, there isn't a Vietnam movie that Purple Haze is an in, you know what I mean? Like it's just, it's, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird mishmash of music, but it works so well. And it, and I know on our last episode, I talked about Daft Punk as being, you know, uh, I can't even remember what the question was. Yeah, a musical was duo. Mu musical duo. And I actually argued Daft Punk. And I feel almost the same way with Jimi Hendrix is it's, it is an experience in itself. And when I think of music and I think of the great Jimi albums. Hendrix experience. What's that? The Jimi Hendrix experience. Well, it's his own experience. Yeah, I guess technically. Uh, but, you know, it's a... I, when I, whenever I hear any of those tracks, I instantly think classic rock, and that that is to me what that album is. It is classic rock. You will never find it anywhere else, and no one will ever debate what it is. It is classic rock. And you would say it's Jimi Hendrix's strongest album. That is the strongest album that Jimi Hendrix did. Okay. Absolutely, and obviously a shorter shorter span than compared to some of our other bands that we've talked about here. But mm -hmm. you know, it is the strongest album. But he's got two other good far. ones: Axis and Electric Ladyland. So those two are fan a lot of people like. Love those Great albums. albums, but they weren't the same thing. Okay, and I just want to be clear. Yeah, Dylan, do you have an answer? Uh, yeah, I do. Okay, um, Dylan, what's your answer? My answer is uh, as. You, as some of you may know, I'm a, a decent, uh, decently big fan of the progressive rock genre, which a lot of people, you know, give a lot of shit and say, ah, it's masturbation, whatever. I think <laughs> when done, when it done is. Done I should start listening. <laughs> done properly, it's great music. So I say that the greatest classic rock album is probably Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. Oh, uh, all right. Let's hear it. We're hearing some, I'm hearing some groans. Uh, yeah, it's because everybody else knows exactly how much crack you've smoked today. <laughs> <laughs> None. Um, I am a, I love Pink Floyd. I love their um, artistic approach to making music. Uh, I love all, I like a lot of their early stuff, uh, you know, pre-Dark Side of the Moon. Oh, yeah. Piper at the Gates of Dawn, I think is a great album. Saucer Full of Secrets is great. Metal, obscured by clouds, but I, you know, often will find myself coming back to Dark Side and saying, This is just nine great tracks of, you know, just kind of pure music. I feel like these guys are pouring every ounce of energy and creativity they can into these, you know, nine tracks that, and some of which I don't consider, you know, even at the time to be really radio friendly and yet the entire album is more or less like a, a raging success to the point where the last two tracks of the album are often played you know hand in hand when they're uh when i hear them on the radio brain damage into eclipse is usually played as just one song but i mean every single song on here i think is known by pretty much everybody i mean just based on you know radio play alone but it's just it, to me like this Maybe there was. I mean, you know, you have bands like Gentle Giant, I guess, around the same time, but they didn't really re achieve the same success. And then you had, you know, follow-up albums, Wish You Were Here, Animals, The Wall, and obviously, you know, around that time was when the band started to peter out. But I I love the sound. I just love it from a sonic point of view. I think that every member of the band is so talented with their um, instruments. I love the duo vocals by Roger Waters and David Gilmore, and I just think they paved the road as influences for a lot of bands down the way, ranging from, you know, 
uh, somebody like Porcupine Tree, which is like a more traditional prog band, to like even really heavy, uh, fast moving uh, black metal bands like Gojira and uh, Machine Head and stuff like that. You know? So I say Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. I'm so ignorant to music, apparently. I have no idea what the fuck he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's okay. Here's... Nobody ever does. I think right now you're making a good case for the strongest prog rock album of all time, but I'm not sure. Yeah, you're, that's the problem. It's not a classic rock album. Well, I, I don't disagree. know about that. What? It's on what? classic rock stations, so. You guys are crazy. There's it's... so many people that love Pink Floyd that I'm like, oh, they're amazing. Me too, man. Yeah. so much airplay on Wait. the classic rock stage. The only thing that's good about Pink Floyd, and the only reason why it's so fucking popular, and every time I hear Pink Floyd, all I think of is drugs and Wizard of Oz, all right? That's <laughs> fucking it, all right? It's it's. It, it's it's an album that's way too fucking long to begin with. Every single track on that album is about five minutes too late. Okay. Now I will give it credit. It is still a great album to listen to. And I'm you know all shitting aside, it is a good album. Is it a classic rock album? Oh hell no. It yeah, you know. I, dude, no, you're you're wrong. It, it, uh, <laughs> you're it, wrong. Like well, that's Jody. good. Just keep yelling at me. That's good. Yeah. Do you like Rush, Jody? <laughs> Absolutely love Rush. Oh my god. Dude, it's, it's in the same vein. Rush is just faster. Yeah, it's called Interesting. Well, I mean, Dark Side of the Moon is the one album, like, I find by Pink Floyd that is, uh, it goes down a different pathway of, um, you know, synthesizers. They use a lot of the, um, That's true. Uh, different uh, techniques well, rather than just, like, like uh, Jimi Hendrix, which is just, like, you know, a three-piece band that is just, you know, kicking ass. Oh, yeah, yeah it is. My argument is that from, for a band to go from art rock to completely mainstream to be accepted like that, that's why I make the argument that they're a great classic rock band because they they took yeah. Style of music that was not traditionally like as uh, approachable as like a Jimi Hendrix or a Zeppelin, and they made it a little. And for whatever reason, Dark Side became a huge phenomenon. It's like everybody knows Dark Side. Everybody knows the Prism. Everybody, everybody has the shirt. I agree with you. It's I know. Like, I we're all merchandised albums. Dave doesn't have the shirt. I barely know about Pig Floyd. Like, well, you know what? You're not missing much. I think they're kind of they're obscure, and people don't really yeah. know them. Dylan, let me ask you a quick question, Dylan, just before we get any further for our audience, which maybe is maybe five, I don't know. Um, just out of curiosity, are you holding a Starbucks right now? <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm drinking a beer. You're drinking a beer. What kind of beer? Uh, I'm drinking a Founders Breakfast Stout. Oh, that sounds good, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you had, all right, all right. You thought he had a hipster right, beer? Right. I, I thought he would have a hipster beer in his in his hand right now, because, you know... Wait, what's hipster beer? PBR? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I, got, I have a question for Dave. Yes. Um, you, you said that earlier you, you considered uh, uh, Goodfellas one of the all-time best classic films. Yes. Well, Do you it, feel that way? Of course. Okay, so how can it be a classic film when it was, you know, done around the era of the rock bands we're talking about? Why aren't they classic, but that movie is? Classic rock and classic movies don't follow the same um, requirements or criteria classic for... Classic is the time, time period in which it's gone. It's you good thing. I'm glad, I'm glad you brought up... I'm glad you brought up Martin Scorsese because Martin Scorsese directed one of the greatest concert films of all time. It was called The Last Waltz. Uh, right, I know what's going on this one in the 1970s, and other classic rock films like The Shine of Light, the Stones movie. None of them hold. Uh, Battle and Hum, man, come on. None of them hold a candle to the Last Waltz, uh, and the yeah, la and in the Last Waltz, what is one of the greatest songs that they play in that show? The night they drove old Dixie down, which happens to be from the Brown album, the band, the greatest classic rock album of all time. Okay, you didn't answer my question. What's considered classic rock? Classic rock is uh, 60s and 70s. Bullshit. Bullshit. Well, it can't yeah, just be that. Let alone the fact you picked a fucking band that only three other people have heard about. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I said. You know what? Like, you know what? I, traditionally, Guns N' Roses, I wouldn't say is a classic rock band, but I think they take a lot more from the bands of the 60s and the 70s than they do of like the the metal bands of the time. So, But I, I don't declare them the greatest Classic rock appetite is the greatest See, I, uh, classic okay. rock I, album. Oh, but I, I oh, moderator's coming. I gotta in. stop it right there because right now I'm in between two and I need the two people to argue against those albums. And I'm sure we'll All right. I you need have the floor. 
Dylan, I need you to argue against oh, Are You Experienced? And I need Jody to argue against Dark Side of the Moon. Because those are, I think, the two that are here, up see, for this right problem. now. here's problem. I, I can't really argue against Hendrix because I think it's, it's great on its own. This is why I'm not great for this podcast because I think Jody makes a lot of great points that I don't disagree with. It's over. Jody wins the, the towel's point. been thrown in. <laughs> yeah, Jody wins the point. I don't disagree with it, whatever Jody has to say because I don't I don't hate Jimi Hendrix. I I would say the only reason that I think it's better is because I'm a bigger Pink Floyd fan. But you could that's you know, my only justification, and that's really weak. Yeah, uh, let's know, not argue this. I got the fucking point. Let's move on. <laughs> I just want to say one thing. I think Dylan could have argued. You know, I think uh, Dark Side is more of like a like one of those first albums that was really like an album from beginning to end. It was like a, almost like a whole story. It was story, a story, right? Yeah. You know, I'm still fucking argue. My point, my <laughs> argument still stands. It comes from a band that, while being critically appreciated was not exactly fitting into the mainstream at the time. Yeah, people who appreciated music, who recognized music, knew who they were. But it wasn't like Hendrix just blew the fuck up the second he was. It took one, two, three, four, five, six, seven albums before they actually... Did I count that right? Two. I think six. Seven, seven albums before Dark Side, Plus. when Dark Side is their eighth album release, before it put them on the spot and that's, oh, that's true. to me that's so friggin amazing you know you go from sort of you go from obscure art rock band who's really doing some new really interesting oh, things oh, to um and then you get a little kind of experimental with that stuff like metal and obscure by class but then dark side they just hit all the right notes the you know no pun intended they did everything right it was a, it was experimental it was abstract but at the same time it was uh, conscious enough of what the audience wanted to hear that people just tuned into it and it was probably released at the right time it was hitting topics that they wanted to that the audience could connect with and it also just has amazing musicianship all right Plus, i'm gonna i'm gonna sum this all up dylan all right it took them seven fucking tries to make a classic rock album mine took the first one we're done <laughs> all, right? all right but i will concede Right. To you, that it was still a very good classic rock album, and I think everybody else was on fucking crack. We called the Brown album. Oh, Brown album, bullshit. At least top three. I didn't even bother to argue because it was just a moot fucking point. I can. <laughs> all right, first of all, no one picks Sergeant Pepper. Sergeant Pepper, great album, but I fucking hate the Beatles. <laughs> no, one Sarge, pick no one picks Sergeant Pepper. Hmm? We don't need a rebuttal to Dave. He's out. I'm out. No, I was gonna give you an extra point, Dylan, but you conceded. The round, the round's over. Jody won. Love, That's right. I love the band a lot, but when you described it, I'm just like, wow, this sounds like the most fucking boring band I've ever heard in my life. It <laughs> is. <laughs> Don't worry, you're not missing anything, Dylan. <laughs> Nothing. I rather light my balls on fire and watch them singe than fucking listen to that shit. All right. Okay, so we're moving on. Sports category. Oh, I'm winning this one too, boys. I hope uh, um, Dylan's able to think of one on the fly here. You might have to look it up. Um, it's okay. Google's your friend. Yeah. Okay. So you go last, Dylan. And your enemy yeah. if you use image Dylan search. will go last. So <laughs> we for the sport category, we are going to go with um, who is the best winner of the Consmite for play in that year's playoff. Uh, so the Consmite is the most valuable player in the playoffs for the NHL Stanley Cup uh, playoffs. So we are going to pick the individual who was picked um, that did the, you know won the won the trophy and in that year. So how his play was in well, that playoff. I, I, so the cons, whoever won the Smythe trophy. Right. right. I'll, just, I'll just go through the list. Yeah, but don't okay. say anything yet. And then you got to make you got to argue why, know. Dylan. So you better learn something about it. So you're going to go last. Uh, we're going to have uh, you know Jody go first. All right. 1984, 1985 season, boys. Let's go back for a second. I was one. Huh? <laughs> I don't give a shit if you're one. All right? You can watch it on an archive. Wayne Gretzky played for the Oilers. Made it. Won the Stanley Cup. We're done, boys. That's it. <laughs> We're pretty much done. But you know what? I'll throw a little bit more in just for fun. Played 18 games in the playoffs. 17 goals, 30 assists. Excellent. 
plain and simple. There was nothing more stellar than that performance that year, okay? And when you look back, and yes, Gretzky wasn't the first time he got, well, actually, was it the first time? Ooh, I might be wrong on that. I think it's the second time he got it at that point because he had it earlier. I don't know. I, I don't have it in front That's of me. That's like what, their first? Dylan second, can look it up when he's there. Their that first was or second cup? Second. Uh, Gretzky got it in 82 and Me 84. Messi. That's right. So it's Messi the second one. Second, second, time, he, second time he won it. So what's special about the second time? Second time was the amount of points. The amount of points. The amount of points he got in total was 47. Uh, I believe the 82 year, which if somebody has Google in front of them, I do not. I think he was... I want to say 10 points differential there. So he had more points in this uh, in this season than the, last, than the last time he won the Conn Smythe. But overall, he had a stellar year. That particular year, he also had played 80 games, got 73 goals, 135 assists for a total of 208 points. You know, uh, but when you think excellence in hockey, you think Gretzky. You're, plain not, and simple. you're, you're arguing regular season. Well, I am arguing regular season. That's because I already told you the playoffs and your fucking chin dropped. All right? <laughs> It's that simple. 47 points in a playoff in, out of 18 games. It's done deal, boys. I'm not going to bother arguing anymore. I protest. Whatever you have is bullshit. I protest. Here comes All right, let's hear Jeff, it. I want the next. I want to go next. All right, Dave, you, you have the floor. <laughs> All right. Go, Dave. All right, now, fuck Gretzky, right? Fuck Gretzky. <laughs> I ought to punch you in the face, boy. <laughs> And the Oilers and everything. Let's let's You're talk a about Calgary fan though. Let's let's come clean here. Hey, this has nothing to do with that. All right. Well, it kind of. I was thinking about who I wanted to pick. I thought about Gretzky for a second, and then it was like, of course you did, because Gretzky is the right answer. I was like, no. You know what he did was not as remarkable as this. 1992, Mario Lemieux, P Pittsburgh Penguins. Less points. He's. Less points, but less games as well. Absolutely. He, he only played 15 games. He scored 16 goals, 18 assists for a total of 34 points. That is 2.26 points per points. game. This is 1992. This is post... Wow, because I have 47. Is 47 bigger, Dave? This is 1992. This is post the 80s where there's like a million goals a game. This is a different style of hockey. Uh, I'm not, not, and not only that, he did this all with an infected and a herniated, a herniated spinal disc. That couldn't slow him down. This is... Ninety one, ninety two. No, ninety ninety. No, that was ninety ninety one. I think. You can no. either pick the ninety one or the ninety two. You can't have both. <laughs> no, I'm right. I'm right. I looked this up. Playoffs you you picked nineteen ninety two. So you got the second time you won the Conn Smythe. Ninety two, Mary Lemieux. You picked the shitty year when he got cancer and ended on a down fucking note. You lose. No, <laughs> no, I'm not done yet. I'm not done. He was, he was, he was maliciously slashed by Adam Graves in one of the series. That he guy had, was a he had a broken wrist, and he scored 34 points, and he won the Conn Smythe. 47 is still bigger than 30. Okay, they beat the Chicago Blackhawks in the final that year, four to nothing. They swept them. Okay, but you're getting your years mixed up here. He did not play those games, miss those games in the '92 season. Okay, what was the year? The year they played Chicago in the final. That was the 92. Was 92. Was okay, 92. I'm arguing 92, and that was the year that he had the infected disc, and he had the broken no, wrist. Not. Yes, it is. 90-91 was. You're arguing with the fucking Penguins fan, dude. That was <laughs> Even a Penguins <laughs> fan told you you're wrong. You Your argument is invalid. Great. He only competed in... the 90 season. Lemieux misses 50 fucking games. Comes back, plays the ones that Dave mentioned earlier... Was out because of a herniated infected disc. Not only does the Penguins pick up star players that year, secure their fucking playoff spot, Lemieux comes back, kicks some fucking ass, 16 goals, 28 assists in the fucking playoffs, but yet, to top all that off, he has one of the greatest fucking goals in NHL history. Gets the mm. puck, skates down to the Minnesota North Stars, and got two defenders, yep. puts the puck that. between his fucking legs, gets the goalie to commit left, Let's the puck slide right into the fucking net as he crashes into the net. How many points? Arguably one of the best goals in NHL history. How many points did he have? 91 season, Dave. 91. How many points did he have Suck in that playoff? Major. How many points? <laughs> how many major. points did he have? 44 points. 90-91. 44, 44 points. 44. Okay. So but he said 92, so we're not even talking the same season. Okay. So, and what was I caught that, other than the fact he was hurt? Canada uses that fucking yeah, yeah, they, they do, do actually. No. Oh, yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah. They, but they have it in like those crazy 3D graphic. So yeah. You know. 
Anyway, uh, well, other than him being hurt, what was iconic about that '92 season? About him winning. About that playoff? Yeah. Just the the story of Mary Lemieux getting the cancer, coming back, winning the Stanley Cup, mm-hmm. helping his team dominate with all the injuries he had. Played those 15 games, and he scored an incredible amount of points in those 15 what games. Game? <laughs> You're not winning this one, man. <laughs> Okay, what, what, all right, so what was the iconic moment of Gretzky in 85? Like, what beats Mario the Muse scoring that goal against Minnesota? Wait, what, what was Jim, is, is, is Jim arguing the season before me? Is that yes. what he's doing? Yes. He's arguing the, the year they beat the North Stars in the final compared to, you're, you're arguing the year they beat the Chicago Blackhawks. Yes, in the final. different year. Different he's year. arguing that year, but using my stats. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really. Where's our fact checker? I'm not even really considering uh, the stats as much as I'm considering the story um, uh, with the Lemieux thing because uh, him winning the second uh, time around is really impressive just to win it back to back. Well, let's hear but, the other guys. I want to. I want to know what else they said. But also, uh, I would like to hear what Dylan has to say. Uh, we don't care about Jim now, right? Dylan's going to argue Brian Leach, New York Rangers, probably, because he loves... Oh, the it. Rangers are terrible. No, I just... Devils, right? I'm poking, I'm poking fun because he's, yeah, he's a double fan. Stevens. I know. The Devils! <laughs> Fuck the Rangers. <laughs> so right. I'm looking at this list, and I'm like, oh, there's actually a decent number of Devils on here, and I'm, I'm a Devils fan. I'm from New Jersey. And I agree but, with you sincerely. But there's uh, one. But I, I'm not uh, as well-versed in the history and the intricacies of the sport as... Uh, you know the four you are. Um, I don't know about so that. So I think you know MVP. It's always got to be somebody that stands out, obviously. And there's there's quite a few standouts on here, but there's not. Uh, you know, I, I'd have to just go like with a name that I recognize well, and I'm gonna go with my fellow Devils fan here. I'm going Gretzky. What year? Jody, what year did you say? He's 84, 85. He said 85. Only won it one other time. So you're, you're by default, are picking 1988. Then I'll go with 88. He was still on the Oilers. So, yeah. it's, you know, yep. it's still a great run as far as I'm concerned. Who did he play in the finals that year? Unless they want to team up and they can split the hey, point. Dylan, say he's the only other player that won it twice that year. He's the only <laughs> other player that won it twice that year. Is that true? No, not that. I either. don't think that's. True. I don't think two people you can win it twice <laughs> the same year. I really don't. No, this is a bad. This is a bad. <laughs> no, he's the only other player to have won the trophy twice. Yeah, but no, that's not true. Mario Lemieux won it twice in two years in a row. Yeah, yeah him and Mario are the only two. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't. I didn't hear you say that. That is correct. And Mario won it back to back, which is even I'm harder. Jim. Jim, do you want to team up here and we'll say why Mario Lemieux is better than Wayne Gretzky? And Bobby Orr got it twice too. Oh, are you arguing Bobby Orr? Yeah, Bobby Orr. No, I'm not arguing. First. I'm just saying that there's other people on here that have won it twice. No, I was wrong. Yep. No, Bernie Bryant won it back to back as well. So, okay. Well, Lemieux was the only other person to win it back to back. My first draft pick for the fantasy league, Martin Verdeur, is not on this list. <laughs> <We didn't. laughs> Dylan, I'm surprised you didn't pick 2003, Jean Sebastian Jaguer, because uh, he's one of the only uh, players, a goalie, to win without winning the cup. He didn't even know who Jaguer played for. But he played for the I Ducks against the, the Devils. Maybe. Played against the Ducks, yeah. Yeah, he well, played Ducks. against the Devils, so There's Dylan might remember that one. That's 2005 slot. Yeah, that's because that was the lockout. Yeah. Oh, that was the lockout, okay. Okay, so um, so you're picking 88, and I, I need some reasons why 88. Is it just because you like Gretzky? I, I like the story of Gretzky. He's the great know? one, damn it. He's the great one. Super Mario. But he's not Jody magnificent. Speaks, Jody speaks for me. This is why we're playing on the same team soon. This is why Jody and I need to be friends. Even I'm on that team too. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> yeah, Maybe we'll have some cuddle time. Before you got here, Dylan. Right now, I'm between the two Marios. I'm trying to decide which one was better. The hurt Mario who has cancer and still won, or the guy who put it through the Minnesota's legs and was pretty much the most iconic goal The better of all story time. is him being hurt and sick. Okay. No, he was hurt 90, He was hurt both years. No, he was Yeah, he was. And he passed the torch that year. He helped train Yager. He was helping yeah. to turn Yager into a leader in that second year. Yeah, big help that is this year. <laughs> yeah, where'd Yager fucking end up? In fucking, uh... Florida. Florida. That's 20 years later. 25 years later. That's a whole well, different... Does that mean Yager's a classic? <laughs> I know he's old. <laughs> 
fucking devils with their old ass players. <laughs> that goal alone, him missing 50 games, coming back, and going into the playoffs and winning the Stanley Cup, it was a high all year long. I'm with Jim. That's a great reason why. That's a movie right My now. My guy was slashed yeah. by Adam Graves. Right, he had a broken wrist. That's the greatest sports movie ever, never made. Best movie based on a true story, the non-existent Mario Lemieux story. <laughs> 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 I, I have to... Uh, wait, 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 wait. You know what it's going you know to be called? Super Mario. Wow. Wow, that's fucking crazy. I want to check when Lemieux broke his wrist from Adam Graves. All right, All right check it. It's gonna He's matter. Oh, I, I know. I, did he not have a Did he not have a broken wrist in the '92 playoffs? Why are we debating this? Fucking Gretzky's the great one for Christ's sakes. They don't call you that for nothing. <laughs> Yeah, but and that con Smythe helped him get that name. I think it's a, the, he's the great game one. two of that series. But, by the way, is the reason why that series was fantastic. Okay, well I need to hear these things. All right, why game two? Tie winning, tie, tie breaking goal right there. I'm sorry, it's just like I think. Does Gretzky have a a, a a statue outside of the stadium with the goal that he made? He has a fucking highway! <laughs> <laughs> Not only does he have a highway, but I have to get off on it. Oh, that came out weird. Uh, but I have to take that off ramp to go to the hockey that we're playing in June. Right. right. Okay, here we go. Lemieux played only 64 games in the injury plagued 91 92 season. Despite missing several games, he won his third Art Ross trophy with 131 points. During the second game of uh, the Patrick Division Finals, Adam Graves slashed and broke his left hand. Lemieux missed, Lemieux missed five games in that playoffs, but he still came back and led with a total of 16 goals and 18 assists. This is a fact. Did he, did he uh, score one of the most amazing goals in NHL history with a broken wrist? I, I need the fact that he scored any goal with a broken wrist, uh, yeah. let alone 18 goals. Is, a, is, is, is amazing. All right, Jim, rebuttal. I need something quick. I need what other than the goal. I told you it ended on He won his third Art Ross. How can it be a down note? They won the Stanley Cup. But then, that, well, doesn't that make it all the more impressive if he won it on a down note? On a down note, other than the up note? Does Mario Lemieux even have a cereal? It doesn't matter. <laughs> like, does he have a cereal? Because that's really the pinnacle here of this argument. Wayne Gretzky, does he have a cereal? Wayne Gretzky got beat out by his own teammate Mark Messier to win uh, the first time they won the cup. He won the cons by first. So if he was the great one, he should have won it right away. He should have won all five. Yeah. But every time Lemieux was eligible for the cons by trophy, he won it. Lemieux. Uh, right Gretzky. now, Walter Gretzky is crying <laughs> because of you. I'm sorry. Try. That's and right. Didn't have a great album until the eighth one. <laughs> <laughs> so Wayne Gretzky can win it the year after he starts. You want a rebuttal, Jeff? The only fact Dave got right was he had a broken fucking wrist. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know. I got the point. I got one. the points right too. Yeah, just the wrong year. No, you didn't. You got the points wrong. Oh, I just looked it up. Thirty-four points. No. Oh, that points. Okay. Okay. Fifteen I think, games. I think, this this is all I think this is all. Uh, highway I, versus guy named Mario. Think about it. I think I, I think it's not even close here. I think Mario wins it. Well, uh, which Mario? I have to pick a year this now, is and I think I have to. Give, I have to give it to Dave because yes. I think Dave there is right. so much goddamn bias at this table I'm right so now. I'm, so, I'm calling bullshit as well. I'm sorry. I think he made a more compelling compelling story just because he won. Why? He scored. Because he got everything wrong. No, just I think I think he was right about a couple things, which is the Adam Graves slash the the fact that Mario won it back to back and won it not on, like you even admitted Jim on a down note, which I think is more impressive than to win it on an up note, you know. Yeah. So. Um, Woo! Um, the only reason they gave it to him the second year is they felt bad for him because he had cancer. <laughs> well, that, 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 that's that's even I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Jeff thinks that the, all every single Marvel movie is fucking great, which includes <laughs> Iron Man three. So by default, Jeff's fucking wrong about everything. I did. I did not say everyone was great. I said he did that, actually say Iron Man three was terrible. It was awful. But I'm not saying everyone. 
I, I know, but I wouldn't say. I would just say, in a, compared to I Star Trek and Star Wars, I thought they, it had a chance. Oh, that was just not. There was no debate there. I don't even know why we bought We're it. We're not going down that road. Even <laughs> I'm, well, even I'm going to say Star because Trek. Because my, my guy did it through adversity. Gretzky, he had y- Yari Curry, he had all these other people. Oh, so and long. he also had about a billion goals. I honestly anyway, think my choice would have been Jaguar. Because. Which one, sir? Jean Sebastian Jaguar. Oh, that's a good pick. Because his play. In that playoff was was he won it despite not winning the cup. Yeah, that was. I'll give you that. You know, so that's who I would have picked, uh, and I was uh, kind of upset that you guys both picked the same player except different years. And just (laughs) I wouldn't have allowed that personally. Just to let you know. Well, uh, I wanted to see the difference. And if I'm ever in that chair, I'm going to make that happen. All right, fair enough. (laughs) All right, but uh, all right. So we move on to our (laughs) history category. All right, on to history. Move away from sports. Uh, I I gotta ask the judge. Yep. That's true. How do you do that? I didn't get it wrong. I you were wrong. You didn't we, get it right. We looked it up. It was right. You are not. Look it up. Not I did. I looked I, it up. I was basing the story, and I think he made it more compelling. You just said it was a great goal, and you almost won based on just the goal. J- One goal. Who cares? Jody was saying. What do you mean? One goal can change the world, man. Doesn't matter. I already won, guys. I don't even know why we're arguing anymore. I won. your bullshit. I won the round. Let's move on. All right. Okay, so we'll move on to our next category. Okay. I gotta go join another podcast. Uh, uh, <laughs> this is bullshit. I'm sorry. I'm gonna do a spin off podcast not, where not, all it is is everything that Dave Mater says is bullshit. <laughs> it's not easy sitting in I'm gonna show. critique I'm it. Uh, there are definitely people who would listen to that. Oh, absolutely. I can think of. Well, no, I wouldn't. I can think there, of at least a few, yeah. yeah okay. I'm not even gonna go there. Just make a podcast called Dave's Full of Shit and Here's Why. <laughs> Hey Dylan, will you be my first uh, first uh, person, first guest? I'll tell you why Dave's full of shit. Yeah. I mean, I, I'll tell you like eight. Yeah, sure. <laughs> the show is not why Dave is full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's go on. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna go to history, and we are going to go to a question. I, I came up with this question. Uh, that question this this way. it spans a large period, but I think. Um, that's what kind of makes it interesting. Uh, I went with what was the most significant invention of the modern age? So like 1825 till the present day. Um, this, is, this is a tough question because there's a lot of things that obviously set the standard for being very, very critical and important. So, I mean, I have one in mind. There's only one answer. Okay, I, so. Uh, Jim, you and I, I don't know. I feel like maybe we have the same opinion, but like, I feel like, I don't know. But this is a tough one. Okay, how about you let it Jim answer, and then you can go after Jim Dillon. All right. All right, Jim, go for it. Well, I guess we need to know if it is, if you pick the same thing when I say it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, say it. The internet. Yeah, I'm, uh, I am I think I'm going to go with the internet. Okay, you can argue together, and you can get you both, already both lost. Get points. You get a half point uh, each? Right. Yeah, well, well, no, they can both get points, as long as they're, they both are a little bit different. Can they both win? Yes. This. They can both win and both get points. All right. What is this horse shit? I think they should have to split the point. If they're going to argue the same I'm thing. The judge if they're teaming up. <laughs> he's the judge and he's in charge, bitch. No, shut up. Um, if I completely make up a bunch of bullshit about the internet. Can I <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it works for Dave. Right. No, we fact check that. Except fact for Dave, what? he doesn't. I'll fact check you. Yeah. You got a chance of winning then. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't be able to, wait, 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 wait. I'm going to make my first point. You wouldn't be able to fact check without the internet. Oh, right. perfect point we right there. We wouldn't be talking to each other without the internet. We wouldn't have... Uh, you know, you guys wouldn't even be met Jody who lives down the street without the internet. That's true. That's true, because you know, that's all I do all day. Take, you can take every single invention and every single thing that's happened, you know, I guess, take away the medical miracles. Okay, is that, are you, is that it, Jim? Or are you... How's that internet working for you, boys? Internet, yeah. You know, the internet itself is, is everything that we've been doing from the time it was invented. Till now, you know, we originally started out for scientists to share information, and it's grown from there and exponentially into what it is today. You can't go anywhere without it unless you're some pygmy tribe in some undiscovered country. Every th- device and everything we use, up in, even our cars and devices that don't use it now are being developed to use it. Everything is connected. Everyone is connected, and it brings the world together. There is nothing that's been developed out of 1825 to 2015 that has brought the world and humanity together the way the internet has. Good or bad, in either way, it still brought the world to where it 
is today and brought everyone together. Okay, Dylan, why the internet? Why the internet? Uh, the internet has, as Jim said, allowed everybody to be connected. It's allowed, every, uh, I mean, just for a prime example of people being connected, the, the five of us talking right now would not um, be the friends uh, that we are uh, if it hadn't been for the internet, if it hadn't been for a message, for a fucking message board that was made during like the mid 90s. Uh, by a guy who we play in a hockey league uh, based after his own liking. Uh, Ming I mean, Chen? Like, what? Ming <laughs> Chen? <laughs> Ming, yes, thank you. Yes, Ming Chen. Wow. <laughs> you know that guy. <laughs> no, but I mean, like, the internet, just like, it, it was a, it was an untapped potential of bringing people together. And I mean, just like, as, a, as I'm saying, like, as an example, like, we're all Kevin Smith fans, and he brought people together through the internet. I mean, just, just his own films. But um, the internet also has just, it's opened up, it's a whole new world that people have had to work around. It's, it's, uh, it's a world that musicians have had to adapt to because they realize that my music is not going to be, uh, I'm, people aren't going to be strictly paying for my music anymore. So I have to adapt and be like, well, people aren't gonna pay for it, so I have to put it out there in cool, interesting manners. Uh, or interesting ways. Um, the internet has given the rise to movements online. Uh, things have gotten done, and uh, people things have changed because of the, the the voices that people are given on the internet. It's it's good and bad. It's bad because I think the internet also gives a degree of uh, actually not a degree, but a huge amount of um, anonymous identification to people. It's uh, which I mean existed prior to this, but probably not to, deg to the degree that existed now. Um, so, I mean, I'm saying this, and I'm not saying that the internet is the greatest invention, but I'm saying that it is definitely one of the most world-changing. I mean, literally every aspect of society has had to change to adjust to the internet. Um, sales, marketing, um, movies, television, music, um, networking, even like, you know, online dating. I mean, before this, it was like, what, blind dates? <laughs> now it's like you have Tinder, you have online dating sites, you have Christian Mingle, for those of you who are very, very, very experimental. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, know, you could even throw in the environmental things with, you know, paper not being as used as much as it, as it was before. Exactly. You know, you don't, I mean, you can publish something now without it being on paper. You can, uh, you can make a movie without ever having to shoot it on film, and you can release it on the internet. I'm, I, I mean, you can it, also release it to tape and have nothing to do with the internet. <laughs> what? I said you can also shoot something on a you know camcorder, a digital camcorder, and release it on DVD without the internet. So I your know, argument is invalid. <clears throat> I know, but you can still use the internet to market that feature. Oh, are we just gonna have a 20-minute circle jerk here, or are you gonna get to a point? <laughs> I mean, me. I think Jim and I's point like stands together. Yeah, I bet you stand together. Okay. <laughs> I think we can move yeah, on. Yeah, me and Weird Uncle Jim. Back, back to Frank. Oh, yeah. All right, um, we will go with Jody next, and we'll go to you. All right. All right. Number one, all I can say about your argument is Skynet. We learned. All right. We need to learn from the Terminator movies. We're fucked if we continue to control cars with fucking internet. All right. We can't even get spyware under control. How are we going to get this under control? Anyway. Point being said, and obviously I'm joking. Remember Battlestar Galactica? You, Absolutely. Adama same. wouldn't have any network computers. Yeah, I know. Like, smart, Jesus. smart cars will turn into Transformers, and that's a good thing. So, I do agree with you that the, the internet is a significant invention. However, it couldn't exist without the telephone. The telephone is what paved the way for all your modern communication. The... <clears throat> It expanded and simplified communication between not only, you know, towns to towns, we're talking cities to cities, provinces to provinces, or if you're American, states to states. All that stuff happened because of that, okay? It also supports all business operations, um, and it also supports global interaction, which is exactly what the internet is. But again, without telephones, we would never have the internet. Uh, the invention of the telephone offered instant form of communication instead of the old dee, 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 you know uh, your your telegraph uh, what was that telegraph yeah <clears throat> you know really old fax machine essentially um, you know faxing there you go same thing you know we shot images across a phone line telephone being the key word here it is such a significant inf um, 
a significant invention of our of this modern age because without it we wouldn't have everything else like it's it, when it comes to communication i mean of course um you know we have the ability to warn people nowadays um you know stuff like that it's it's an invention and i know it realistically it was invented i think prior to 1825 which is what mm -hmm. i think our cutoff was was it not uh, no it, it was invented after oh 18 1876 oh, okay there we go so good i'm actually in the area i thought it wasn't um my my point was that it was perfected uh fairly quickly um we ended up getting much better ways of doing things and now we're dealing with the fact that there's so many phones globally we now have to find different ways of dialing the damn phone because of it. You know, before it was like, you know, Klondike 562, you know, that kind of thing or whatever, you know, they always did in the old movies and stuff like that. But, yeah. you know, you, you called up and said, I wanted to talk to, you know, extension eight, you know, <laughs> way back in the day. Uh, you yeah, know, now, connect you. Yeah, give me a second, I'll connect you with the wires, you know, that kind of thing. But without all of that, you wouldn't have stuff like modern networking. You wouldn't have the internet. You wouldn't have your DNS servers that run your internet. Um, you know, you wouldn't have all of that stuff because it was all based on the simple communication form of the telephone. And I think without, without the telephone, you would never have what you guys just argued. Uh, I'm not saying the internet wasn't a significant invention because I believe it was. And, you know, obviously all of us are, you know, using a, a method which is going to actually be on the internet and distributed to hopefully tens of people. But anyway, the, uh, it's a growing following. Yes, exactly. You know, everybody support me. I, I don't disagree with your points, Jody, but I'm just, I'll say this. Obviously, the telephone is a hugely important uh, creation. And now we have something like the iPhone, which is basically a. Like if they, I'm just saying, okay, excuse me, a smartphone, which mm -hmm. is a, the fucking internet and a phone fucked and had a baby, but I'll say this about the internet, in the uh, decades that the phone was around, the internet managed to progress within like, what, a quarter of it? Yeah, but technology also progressed with it, so that's not really know, a, a, I, a fair that, point. I, that alone, I think, is pretty amazing. Oh, absolutely. It's amazing. But it's not the most significant invention of the modern age. No, it's not. Okay, Dave. But let's hear what Dave has to say because we never comes up with. It's probably going to be the record player so I can listen to the Brown album. Terrible fucking album, but anyway. The greatest invention of all time trumps both of yours easily. Let's hear it. Of the modern era. And it is Matt. Jim, that should have been my choice. What was that? The toilet. The, the toilet? toilet? That's well, that is a good invention. That is, that's solid. Do you know how much I shit? <laughs> yes, I do. It's, it, 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 it is a good invention, but I can tell you what's better and what has allowed both of your inventions to even exist is... Mary of the Mew? Mary of the Mew. My argument is... Mario the Mew's bad disc? Are you guys done? <laughs> can, I, can I make my point now? No, sure. Come on, let's give him a second to make his point before we shit all over it. <laughs> oh, shit, like the brown album? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, it is man's harnessing of electricity. Electricity is the greatest invention of the modern age. And it's not an invention. It's not an invention. <laughs> they were going to say that. Right. Wait a minute. Wait, wait. Electricity is a natural phenomenon. It didn't exist. It it existed without harnessing <laughs> it. <laughs> Jesus Christ! I could rub a cat in the 17th century and get electricity. Come on. No, it's man's harnessing of electricity. Killed and dinosaurs. For like it could have at least said capacitor or something, and I would have went further. With my, that. my my basic argument is a circuit, or a light bulb, or something like that. Oh. The the ability to put energy through a man-made object. So let's say the basic circuit or the basic light bulb. Invention. I can have light by fucking dipping a, a piece of wood in oil and lighting it on fire with a rock. What changed at the turn of the century? When, when did we get out of the... Uh, the Brown Album. The Brown Album. <laughs> the Brown Era. Right? Think about it. It's when electricity was invented or harnessed. Really? Because I'm pretty sure those steam engines ran pretty good without it. Yeah, but we didn't have a lot of things. And, and what we were able to accomplish since that was introduced into our realm of, of, uh, of harnessing and, 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 and manipulation, it changed the entire world. It, there, there would be no internet without electricity. 
There would be no phones without electricity. There would be nothing. It's not invention. It would be the Stone Age, guys. We'd it's be not, in the it's Stone not Age. Not an invention, though. That's the problem. <laughs> It's a resource that was that was waiting to be uh, uh, invented. Without electricity, boys, we wouldn't have the crack that Dave was smoking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling bullshit on this. I didn't even have to do. I'm research. calling bullshit on this too. How many how many bullshits do we have to have before think, he's eliminated? No, I think this is the bullshit that he's not gonna get past. <laughs> All right, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> I think we won that it's one. It's a good try, though. But no, but you guys haven't beat yourself. Like, no, I haven't decided between the internet and the telephone. Okay, and you know what? Wait, 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 stop. I'm going to give Dave a couple minutes to try and sell this to me. And if I don't burst out laughing <laughs> I'm done, I'll, I say we give him a point. I okay. say within 15 seconds you're going to burst out laughing. All right. <laughs> Dylan, you're Benjamin Franklin. You're flying that no, key. I'm up. <laughs> Pre-modern era as well. Right. This is this is the pre-modern era. Benjamin Franklin flies that key up the, the kite. He realizes that electricity can be harnessed through man-made objects. And he learns to okay, pass so that you know knowledge. You know what I've gotten from this story? That the greatest invention of mankind was the fucking key. <laughs> or kite. <laughs> hey, keys are important. Let's not knock them. Keys are important. And keys allowed us to invent electricity. Which gave us the ability to invent a whole plethora of things that we never could have before. It can get two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> In fairness to what he's saying, you know, it did. It, it says here it, it led to the invention of something called a Leyden jar as a device for storing large amounts of electrical yeah. charge, which is yeah, what, I'm not, a battery. Not the importance of it, but it still is not man. Made. This is my invention, guys. We no, it learned that's a battery. This is the Matrix. Oh, back up, guys. <laughs> that's like saying oil's the greatest invention. <laughs> Discovery, maybe, but not invention. But you, 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 you have to learn what to do with it, like any resource. Sure. Yeah, but they discovered. Right. That's like saying boats aren't an invention because like, water was I already there. Water in a glass, did I invent it? You invent you. But that's like saying we the glass would be fire. the invention. Or that's like saying we invented fire. But we you, invent but your your entire fire. your entire argument is based on the fact of the most significant invention of the modern age is electricity. It existed prior to the modern age. It's Good it's. Point. But not our ability to use it. You are digging a hole. There's just no way you're gonna get out of this. To, you're done. Pavement would take, pavement would take elect, uh, branches broken off of trees that were caught on fire from lightning storms. And I'm pretty sure. Lightning, by the way, electricity. I'm almost positive that there's probably been some fucking brachiosaurus that was walking through a very open field during a thunderstorm because it got separated from its herd and unfortunately was zapped to death because it was the tallest goddamn object in that fucking field. But not on purpose. Not on, yeah. not on yeah, purpose. And that's my point. <laughs> Using electricity on purpose is the invention. Okay. Oh, this is I think a terrible hole. I think we need to move oh, beyond this. Yeah, let's Maybe move beyond this. <laughs> and we need to understand why um, the, there's more significance for the telephone over the internet. I need to hear that from Jody. As I said previously, without the uh, telephone, uh, what's that? Nothing. I was just groaning. Don't you dare fucking interrupt me. <laughs> I don't think it was at you, Jody. I know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it was probably at. Was it was probably at those naked <laughs> pictures he's looking on the internet, right? Which, by the way, you wouldn't have without the telephone. The telephone gave you. An Which you wouldn't have without electricity. Oh, whatever. Shut up. Yeah, let me harness the power of the telephone, you ass. <laughs> anyway, the telephone being a invention, which I think you seem to have missed the point of what an invention is, uh, allowed us instant communication to people that were not present with us. And that is exactly what the internet is. The internet is a mass, mass web, which obviously has been used in various uh, methods. Intertubes. Intertubes, interthingers. Anyway, the with it's a fucky. Yeah, but either way, without the telephone paving the way, you would not have the internet. It wouldn't exist. The first forms of the internet were on uh, were on uh, local networks. After that, turned into the telephone. We all remember the whole squealy, squealy, squealy thing. You mean uh, dial up? Yeah, dial up exactly. Um, now, obviously, dial up is the first iteration of the internet. 
Either way, without that, you would never have it because we wouldn't have, we would still be sitting there doing the smoke signals. And I tell you right now, I don't know what the baud rate is of the smoke signal, but it is certainly not where we are now. It is fast. It is long reaching. If I wasn't within view of a smoke signal, I couldn't, I couldn't know what was going on. A telephone I can call around the goddamn world, plain and simple. And that is what gave us the internet. Okay, Dylan and Jim, why is the internet more you significant? The telephone was fast. Wait, um, what's that? Jody, I, I have a quick question. It was fast compared to walking. Are, did, Jody, are you within proximity to Dave? Right now, yes. Yes. Am I normally within proximity of Dave? No, but you know how I get a hold of him with my cellular phone. Well, I was going to say because if you are within uh, proximity to him, one of the plus sides to having a phone, you can throw it at his boneheaded head. <laughs> <laughs> and just one quick, uh, quick point, actually, which you've just brought up, which is even better for me, is regardless of phone or internet, I can still call the same distance. You wouldn't so be able to do it. The phone could have achieved exactly what we're doing right now, achieved Dave, back then. <laughs> Wait, from your cell phone, you're saying? Yeah, I can call from my cell phone and get somebody around the world. I can call Dylan right now on my cell phone. I don't have his right, number, you're, but... You're saying your cell phone, though, would have existed without the internet? What's that? My cell phone would definitely have existed without the internet. They did exist before yeah, the internet. I mean, years, basically. No, it is... No, I think he's right, because cell phones, they're not... They're, they're not data-driven. They just they are now. a relay tower to send a signal, correct? Exactly. It's a fancy fr radio frequency. Keep in mind, boys, I work for a mobility company. Yeah, I'm surprised, but you, I'm surprised <laughs> you didn't pick internet. Yeah. I wanted to pick internet, but the telephone is what started. I wouldn't have picked either of these things. That's because you're terrible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Dylan and Jim, I need to hear why internet is more significant in the modern age than the telephone. Because the telephone ranges over about 100 years up until the internet really starts to really form. But we're still using telephones today. We are. You are you're still using electricity. Using just for telephone. telephone. What are you talking about? I use the same. I use a landline telephone at work. It's not a. It's not a VoIP phone. I do have a VoIP phone, but I also have a manual phone as well. And when you call nine one one, and yes, it does have electricity. So let's get his point in. It has electricity. Because he's gonna jump in and say, "And you wouldn't fucking have that without electricity." <laughs> okay, but even if the phone was never invented, people would have still figured out a way to. Traverse light through a tube. No, I. Mm, we would I have no know. reason to. Yes, they would have. If I don't the know. phone never existed, they would have figured out how to put light through a tube exactly how they did to create the internet. That's not what I'm asking. Why is it more significant? Why is the internet more significant than, than the phone? The phone it ranges over all this time. Why is it more significant to, to the modern age? All right, here's okay, so the, the phone. The phone is very significant and, and you know, probably one of the best inventions. I'm not going to dispute that. But the phone was very limited in what it could do versus what the internet could do. That's what I was going to say. The internet opens up a huge range of possibilities that you can do that you cannot do on the phone. Goat porn in every language. How much can you do on the internet without a computer? Isn't that a better invention? The computer? The computer? Well, the computer, the internet is computers. Okay, same thing? No, it's not No, true. it's not. Because I don't think it is. No, it's not. Computers in... Since the 19, what, the 40s? The, the 30s? Mm -hmm. It's the 40s, yeah. Like, the first computers were used mostly as decoders. But we're talking about connection. And... But if we're talking about connection, then... If we're just talking about connection, we're not talking about computers. We're talking about the development of the internet, the systematic uh, uh, connection worldwide that more or less connects everybody. Uh, and opens up a whole range of non-safe, you know, you're not really safe on the internet as much as people wish they were. But anyway, um, it opens up a massive range of things that you can do that is not able to be done on the phone without like a lot of extra effort done. Like you can pretty much, you, you know, there are people who have built careers off of the internet. I'm sure there's people that have built careers off the phone, no doubt, but I'm just saying that there's a much broader range of things that you can actually get done via the internet. Dylan, you, you're, you and Jim are connecting right now through Skype, right? Yes. Skype is a send and receive audio application, correct? 
Sounds right. Yeah, right. you can also access on an iPhone. You know what the best thing about it is, Dylan? And I'll tell you how iconic the telephone is and how significant it was. The button for me to hang up on your ass right now looks like a fucking telephone. <laughs> okay? Wait, okay, so does your telephone send everything in ones and zeros? What's that? Does your telephone send things in ones and zeros? Depends on which connection we do, but yes, in most scenarios right then, now it does. does your, That's does binary, which is computer, has nothing to do with the it. fucking internet. Right. Binary existed yes, before. Because you just said Skype is... Jeff, you better, you better, you better I, call I this. I gotta make this call. Ones and zeros. It doesn't... That, and it, it doesn't do it handshaking. It sends it through the internet. If I had heard a little bit more of the computer aspect to the internet, I think I would have given it to the internet, but I have to give it to the phone. You don't need a computer to use the internet. I didn't say yes, you did. Really? Tell me one device that runs the internet that doesn't use a computer. Jim, I'm sorry, but... Uh, Tell me one CPU. Computer. Yeah. yeah. Is it? So then it's really not a phone then. <clears throat> What's that? Well, My phone has an analog chip in it that allows me to make phone calls. I'm giving it to the phone. He's so giving Jody it to the phone the anyway. Point. Jody wins the point. Shut up or I'll hang up on you with the icon that looks like a phone. <laughs> <laughs> you know what the biggest problem here is? Dave. I have a hard time not disagreeing with the people I'm arguing with. That's what makes this show fun, though. Yeah. It is fun. Because, like last week, anybody who listened so, to last week... I learned about the Boston uh, Boston Celtics last week. Didn't know a fucking thing about it. But I learned. I also didn't know that electricity was an invention up until the night. <laughs> I didn't know that either. Okay. We both learned something. We both learned something. You know and I didn't get the point. For other than minute. Dave is a knob. Just like last week, the history category, I think, took the longest. It did. Yeah. The, the history gets the history people going. Yeah. The one that's the worst because people will defend it to the death. Yes. Okay, so now we're going to a wild card. Wild now, card. I felt like I would kind of um, combine two categories in one because that would, I feel like, best Which, honor. by the way, I like this uh, I like this question. This I felt like question. it would best honor at least two of the categories, and I think we should strive to do that every week with the wild card. I think or that's just, a good idea. You know, or just go with something idea. real oddball. Odd, I did. Topic. My question was science fiction. That that could have been TV, movies. Yeah, you were. You were. You did, you All did. we know is Jerry was bullshit on that one. <laughs> Plain and simple. <laughs> okay, so the wild card. My question is, what is the best music soundtrack to a movie? Oh, this is so, a... Wait, I, quick question. Is this like orchestral or is this like composed of... Not various... a score. Good question. It, this is not a score. This is like um, okay. a compilation of like, songs. This is like I go, I see a movie, I go out and I buy a CD. Yes, soundtrack. You know? Yeah, but you can do that with an orchestral. It, also it, orchestral it can be orchestral. But it's not it's 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 not necessarily the score of the movie. Well, look at the Back to the Future soundtrack. That was like what two Lu Huey Lewis songs, and then the rest was a score. Right, right, right. That's a soundtrack. That's a, it's totally. Soundtrack. I still count that as a soundtrack. Oh, yeah, it, it I, I agree. It is absolutely. But if it, if it, if it's just a score, it I don't even know why I'm arguing this because my answer has nothing to do with it. This. Still counts. It, you could still argue for it if you want. Dylan's totally on the right page. But uh, if for the nature of the. The question I feel like most people will go to uh, what movie soundtrack where you you know beat after beat after beat you know you kind of like love it's like an songs. album it's kind of like an album but it's associated with a movie. Okay, so I would like to go to uh, Dave first. Okay, my electricity. <laughs> <laughs> well, not music, electricity at least not the digital form. <laughs> um, my answer is. A move, uh, soundtrack to a movie that was released in 2012, so, so fairly recent, Django Unchained. That was a good album, though. It is 59 minutes and 16 seconds of pure entertainment. Oh. And it ranges. It's not just one thing. It's a whole bunch of things. That's true. Right? It, go, it has a rap song in 100 Black Coffins, which was uh, uh, created by uh, and produced by Jamie Foxx. It has um, I Got a Name, one of the great Jim Croce songs of all time. Classic rock. You know, it has... Um, Is there anything from the Brown it's, album it, on it? No, <laughs> nothing from the Brown album. And it's it relies heavily on spaghetti western style music. So it has these great operatic 
um, songs. And you can if you've seen the film, you know how important the music is to that film. Mm -hmm. uh, Tarantino says, you know, he would never let somebody score his entire movie because he would never give somebody that kind of power. He wants to can't put, afford it. He wants maybe maybe there, there's that. John benefit. Williams is like, you can fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, trust me, fuck you. <laughs> you know, he said like, he would give anybody that kind of power. It, it, the personalization, same thing with Scorsese. Um, they pick songs that really help frame the mood of each scene. But this isn't just him picking a bunch of the hits. There were songs that were written just for the movie that are on this soundtrack, mm -hmm. including Freedom, which uh, I can't like, believe wasn't nominated for an Academy Award because it was most definitely the best song of 2012. And I think some like... Did you give Academy Awards for songs? Yep. Yeah, best for best, best original song. Written. Oh, original song. Okay. Okay. For the movie. Written, Excuse written my ignorance, I didn't know that. I, I don't know how it got snubbed, but it was... The best song that year. I think something like Beyonce won or some some. Did Kanye like interrupt the? Kanye came in and he screwed the whole fucking <laughs> he's thing like, up. He's like, fuck this, fuck this. Um, he came out in like a bolt of lightning. You know, just like just the part. Harnessed of, one. Just the part, the song as well. Like his name was King, right? Which talks about uh, Dr. Schultz King, the bounty hunter character from that film. You know, his name was King. He had a horse. You know, it's like. <laughs> It's just uh, like he he's loses pulling you in, it, right? Right. It's got like these amazing Italian <laughs> artists who are contributors as well. It's a, it is a full picture album, and you listen to that thing, and you've had an experience, uh, maybe even better than watching the movie itself. Hmm. Good. Okay. Well, let's go to uh, Jim. I picked Juice. That was actually a good soundtrack. It's a good soundtrack. I still I have that soundtrack in my car. What is Juice? Is the movie with Tupac? Tupac oh, Lamar X. The oh, they're in a movie together, those guys. Yeah. Okay. 1982. Oh, no. Them black folk. All right, let Jim explain. All right, I just said those on. guys. Oh, All right, Jody. <laughs> Anywho, okay. So. <laughs> Sorry, I had to mute for a second. Anyway, I picked uh, the Juice. So first of all, not only did it not have a, a track from Tupac Shakur on it, which was the main star in the movie, mm -hmm. it included Body by Nature, Eric B. and Rakim, MC Poo, Big Daddy Kane, Too Short, Salt and Pepper, Cypress Hill, you know, on and on, you know, which was unheard of for hip hop at the time. Let alone it went on to uh, be number 17 on the Billboard 200 and uh, number three on one of the top R&B albums of all time. So it did a lot for the uh, hip hop community as far as the soundtrack and uh, different artists showcasing on there that were already stars themselves. Hmm. Okay, is that it? Yep. Okay, Jody. This was a tough one for me because as a massive movie fan and also a, a fairly big music fan as well. To me, the the whole essence of this question was a soundtrack that not only, as Dave kind of said, complements the uh, complements the actual movie that it was in, um, but I th I will actually take it up a step further and say that every single time I hear tracks from that album now, I think of that movie and even the scenes that they were in. Um, the one that I picked was Train Spotting. Okay. Mm. And the reason why I picked Train Spotting is, well, number one, anybody who's ever seen it, and I assume everybody here has. Anybody hasn't? It's been years. I, I, have, not, I have not seen it, unfortunately. You're a terrible man. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I got disturbed by that film no, because... It is a very disturbing weird. film. I Eamon had just been born. And oh, I, that will be even more And disturbing. I watched that, that movie and I was like... <laughs> I and the baby on the ceiling? Yeah. No, that's that's a done deal. No, sure. it's... Well, spoilers, it's the dead baby in that yeah, movie. But regardless... Either way, the the movie certainly isn't your uh, your your happy go lucky movie for sure. Um, you know anybody who's not familiar with it, basically about um, you know obviously heroin use, um, you know, and you know London, Scotland uh, uh, type of uh, scene. Um, the reason why I think it worked really well was the fact that you had such a different amount of music on that on the, like every track is not the same as the one that was previously played. Uh, but every time I hear every song on that album, I rethink that movie, and that to me is what a soundtrack is. A soundtrack to me should be a soundtrack that not only retells that story again, uh, but also brings back some of that emotion that you actually experience from watching that movie. Train Spotting, I've seen maybe a handful of times, and I have no interest in keep rewatching the movie. In in my opinion, not the greatest of movies, but certainly not a terrible movie by any means either. But it is a disturbing film. And as as Dave said, there is some scenes in there that are just, you don't want to relive, but there's a lot of scenes that you do. 
Um, you know, you have, you know, veteran punk guys like, you know, Lou Reed, um, Iggy Pop, for instance. But you also have, you know, um, for instance, Pulp. Um, Pulp being, you know, obviously a much different sound, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you also have, you know, for instance, um, sorry, who am I thinking of? Underworld, you know, being, you know, a very techno-y, very, well, I, I hate to use the term electronica, um, you know, which also complemented a lot of the scenes in the movie. Um, every time I hear that album, and it is an album I still play in quite heavy rotation, you know, bumming in the car, whatever. Uh, I don't mean that literally, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, bumming around in the car, again, don't take it literally. Um, but it still retells that story every time I hear it. And I can picture scene for scene every single one of those tracks on that album. And I experience that movie, even without visually seeing it, I still experience the movie over and over again. Okay. And I think that is really what a soundtrack should be, and that's why I think it's one of the best soundtracks. Dylan the Villain, what is your choice? It's impressive. It's actually two volumes worth of music yes. uh, for train spotting. That's very it cool. is, yeah. Um, yes, it is. So uh, I'm kind of in the same boat as Jody in that there's, like, music is such a great complement to film, and I can think of, like, a number of movies where the music uh, complements the film. Um, just like. Jody is a big fan of it. I think the Tron Legacy soundtrack is amazing. Oh, um, gorgeous soundtrack. I love that one. It's not my pick for this one. Okay, I thought um, it was. Because I went, I went with some, because I'm kind of doing this podcast a little off the cuff. Yeah. Um, I'm, Donnie Darko is another one where the music is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and I'll even say this. Um, I think that a film that brought kind of, you know, brought all of us together, Clerks, has an amazing soundtrack. It I mean, is. You have so many yeah. people on here. Sure. But the film that I'm going to say that has the best sound, uh, what I'm going off of, uh, when I look at it and say that this is um, the best soundtrack, uh, is the movie Singles. Uh, I'm not going to go there with you. Okay, that's not. But all right, let's hear it. To the here after all those other movies. <laughs> that is really. I was like, why did he pick any of those other ones? <laughs> <laughs> why didn't he pick something about electricity? <laughs> Tron's got about electricity. Yeah. Tron's good. You wouldn't have Tron without electricity, boys. <laughs> Tron wouldn't be around without the internet. This is also true. You know, guys, it wouldn't be CDs without electricity. <laughs> okay, why Singles? singles? Um, I love the movie Singles, um, and I love the fact that it's a movie, you know, kind of based out of two things. It's all about the Seattle, it's all it takes place in Seattle during kind of like the early 90s and the grunge scene and that plays like kind of the big backdrop for the movie. And I love that it plays such a big part in the film, um, but I love that every single band on this is very recognizable of that era. Uh, barring Paul Westerberg, who if you don't know is like the main guy behind the replacements and I am also a huge replacements fan and he has two songs on here. But I kind of love that this is a movie about people and the fact that like music brings them together and affects their lives. And I think that every single song on here kind of complements that whole film and, and the themes of that, regardless of it's like, you know, a really kind of down song like Wood by Alice in Chains or, uh, hey, guess what? There's a Jimi Hendrix Experience on, uh, <laughs> song on here. Just say it. That's Just some good it. taste. Man, Smashing Pumpkins, you got Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, this is some good stuff Tree, here. Tree, it's like, pump, it's, pump. it's all the grunge rock. Yeah, but uh, you know what, it's set it's in Seattle. Set, but, the movie's set in Seattle, it fits yeah. very much with that time and that place. But, but when I hear every one of those tracks, I don't think of that movie. Uh, I, 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 I do, and I think that it just complements it so well, and that you couldn't, you couldn't make this movie without having these, these bands being the soundtrack to it. You know, I, I've never seen the movie. I can only go off Dylan's argument. It is a good movie, though, for sure. It's yeah. a very good movie. It's a great, uh, it's a great uh, uh, romance film. And like, I'm not a huge romance film person, but I, it's a great movie. Plus, it's got Matt Dillon with long hair, and he's in a band called Citizen Dick. Well, I can't oh. beat that. Can't beat Citizen Dick. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Actually, technically, you can beat a dick. Place. I think I think all of uh, your answers are subjective and they're all good for their movies, but uh, I need to kind of start narrowing it down a little bit. And uh, the way I'm going to do this is because it's so subjective, I'm going to um, kind of let you guys decide if you can't pick your own, which one would you most want to listen to? 
mm. as a soundtrack. So. I like that. So Jody, which soundtrack would you? What was Jim's answer again? Sorry. His Jim. answer was Juice. Juice. What'd I would have to pick Juice. You said okay, so he and gets the a reason, point. For and that. the reason being is because it is a great album, and it really is. It is exactly what the representation of that movie should have been, and I feel the same way when I listen to that tra- album as I do with Train Spotting. It's an album that brings back various uh, scenes. I don't think it's honestly. I don't really think it's as predominant with me as, for instance, the Train Spotting experience would be. Okay. Um, because I think Train Spotting is a much more powerful movie, where Juice was essentially another one of those movies, right? But even still, though, if I had to pick between all the ones that were picked, yep. I would go with Juice. Okay, Dave. Which soundtrack would you pick to listen to if you didn't couldn't listen to Django? You have to pick one of those three. Um, singles. Okay, so another one. Uh, I just the like. I like hip hop sort of, but um, it's like Juice isn't up my alley. And I was looking at the Train Spotting picks, and it's a lot of it's a lot of like techno, progressive rock, and Iggy Pop, and no, David Iggy Bowie, and these groups, and like they're they're fine, <laughs> they're fine, but you have no idea what the soundtrack of Train Spotting even is. There's two, there's two albums to it. I know. I was I was looking at the tracks, and okay. I was like. Nah. But how many of those people on those on that on that album do you actually know? I don't know. Like, oh, you know what? Though? Hey, it's subjective. It this is, is so subjective, though. It's subjective. I'm just telling you what I would want to listen to. Fair enough. Fair enough. And you know what, Dave? Uh, in all honesty, if you heard some of these songs, you'd probably know what they were without knowing that that that's the name of the song or that's the artist. What you mean for your movie or yeah. your soundtrack? Um, uh, train spotting. He's, he's defending train spotting. Here. I, I don't know why. But um, well, I think there are a couple of moments in Train Spotting. I think yeah, you know, it was a good pick by Jody. Does like the music really, um, like especially at the it end, it gets at you. the end there where they I think they're uh, and that's the experience that you experience right after. Yeah. What yeah. I would want to listen to, what I want from a listening experience, and this is just me. It's not those those types of songs. Train, like I've seen Train Spotting. Remember, I remember the music, but nothing in that that movie connected with me personally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I definitely Django is the one that connects the most with me. That's my yep. pick. But yep. I, uh, it would it, for me, it would be singles. It would be it would be the the early '90s garage punk rock, or sorry, uh, grunge rock, not punk rock, grunge rock. The uh, the Seattle setting and to me that would put me in the mood of the film, uh, and and paired with the fact that I like those songs more. Okay, Jim can't pick Juice. Which album are you listening to? Uh, that's a tough one. I like the, a lot of the songs uh, that are in singles. Uh, I gotta be honest, I've, I've never even seen the new movie. I mean, I just read the overview of it and looked at the, the tracks on it. The tracks are awesome. You're missing out. It's a good movie. What's that? It's a good movie. You're missing out. I've never seen the film either. I, I'm just going off the songs as well, and I like those songs. But having seen Train Spotting and, and knowing how the songs fit in there, I'd have to pick Train Spotting. Okay. And Dylan, which album are you listening um, to? I'm gonna not pick Django because as much as I really like that movie, I the soundtrack honestly wasn't something that really rang forward when I saw it. So I'd have to watch the movie again. So that's out. Uh, I haven't seen Juice, but I'm pretty. But like, I'm pretty open to a variety of films. Um, but if I were to pick between Juice and Train Spotting, just by the nature of who I am, I would have to go to Train Spotting because I have. A, big affinity for um, a lot of those artists on there and I mean it's a pretty stacked soundtrack in terms of like the UK and American like punk rock and um, glam rock and you know a little bit of the uh, electronic aspect into it I mean unfortunately I haven't seen the movie but I uh, just going off of that soundtrack I look at that and say that's an amazing soundtrack not denying that Juice is it but I'm just you know more partial to the train spotting so my vote goes to train spotting Okay, Jody wins the point. There we go. So Jody wins the major round. I win three, the majors. Three to two. Do I get a coat? To one. Jim, Do I get like a coat? Like a Jim, vest? unfortunately, you don't get to move on to the speed round. That is Jody and Dave's honor to Woo. duke it out. Now, Jody, but now, just to be clear, I've already won. Right. Well, you won the major round. All right. It which goes, is, a major is better than a minor. You're only beating me by one right now. Yeah. One is all I needed. You mean Jim and Dylan don't get to move on? Uh, Dylan, yeah, I don't think you anything, dude. Don't forget little Dylan. Don't forget Dylan. <laughs> I, you know what? Dylan was really close on that yeah, one. All you guys were giving him props, and Dylan was really close. And had Dave, uh, not Dave, had Jody 
picked. In singles. all fairness, that is a great album. If he had picked singles, I think I would have given the edge to Dylan, but he picked Juice, and so it I even like the points. It was a great album. And so Transpotting ended up taking it. So, um, Okay, so I am going to move on to the speed round here. Now, the way this speed round is going to work is I'm going to ask a question. One of you is going to say it first. Now the other one has to argue the other side. Whoever Maybe gets it first. Whoever get whoever gets it first gets to argue that side. And the person who says it first has to go first. Uh, yeah, Let's, okay. we'll, we'll do that as well right. because they they have advantage as far as uh, right. you know getting first impression and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Okay. So for movies, all right. First question. There's one trilogy you have to watch it in a row. You have to watch this trilogy. Iron Man. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I should have picked that. You have to watch this trilogy, and you have to watch it all in a row. No, no breaks, no commercials. No, you have to watch it all in a row. Taken or Hangover? Hangover. Really, <laughs> really, I'll take what? Taken. I'm totally fine for that. You just right. lost yourself around, sir. <laughs> okay. All right. What are the choices again? Taken or the Hangover trilogy? Oh, I thought it was any tri- uh, any trilogy. Oh. No, no. Um, Okay, no, it's my go. It's Dave's go. He gets, the, he, he gets he, to defend why Hangover overtaken. Hangover is a great series. It's a great trilogy. Stephen it's a great Mod- one movie. That's hey, for sure. hey, hey, let me... All I, right, sorry. My turn in the speed round. Um, it's a great trilogy. Uh, it, like, Stephen Nottam told me so. And he, <laughs> you know, it's... The first movie really sets up the second and the third parts. Like, those characters are entertaining to watch. They're funny. They're engaging. There's good actors in every single one. There's great little bits and jokes. N- none of them are unfunny movies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure, uh, there's some criticism to the sequels, you know, just uh, recycling the same concept. But the third movie went a completely different way. And if I had to watch either one of these series in a row, it would definitely be The Hangover. The Taken is barely watchable as the first movie. So, like, it's, it's a stupid fucking premise. Like, he's, he's running around fucking trying to find his daughter. And they just recycle it twice. Like, I was like, when that movie came out, I was like, I would have been fine if it had just been the single movie. And we're like, we can forget about that movie. And, you know, everyone was like, remember Taken? Oh, sure, whatever. But everybody's always going to remember The Hangovers. It's a great comedy trilogy of its time and of that particular era, the late 2000s or whatever, uh-ohs, whatever that decade's called. So, definitely. Jody. Unfucking believable all right anyway <laughs> all right taken a liam star neeson wars. movie what's that star wars fuck you star wars <laughs> well original trilogy not the original or the second one i the guess prequels the prequels. very different genres anyway like i'm supposed to be arguing with taken yeah taken the first movie in my opinion has made liam Nelson a absolute amazing actor when it comes to suspense and action movie mm-hmm. It's something. It took him out of. It took him out of that little mold that he had, where he did period pieces, and you know, sure. he got to be in terrible Lucas prequels. It, it gave me everything that I was hoping to see, and it started with you know, we, we started kind of seeing the chops work with that. What was it? The wolf one. I can't remember. Sorry. Anyway, the the, the movie before that, Gray or something. There you go. Okay. Uh, the Gray, I guess, or something like that. But anyway, we we got to see a little bite of that, and then Taken gave us. Everything we wanted from that. It's got action. Um, I will agree with Dave to the fact that it is a reused premise, but you know, so was the second and third Hangover movies. Um, the The movie itself was entertaining to watch. It was it spanned among the spectrum of people. My wife can watch it and enjoy it, whereas the Hangover she thought was fuck. Well, the first one she liked, the second one she thought was fucking terrible because most of the people in the world did. And let's face it, if you're gonna and honestly, I've never seen the third, even though I own the trilogy on Blu-ray. I've never seen the third because that's how fucking awful the second one was. My I can still taste how terrible that movie was in my mouth. Uh, I, where I, Taken I, Two was still just as good as the first one, in my opinion. Uh, different, slightly different setting, same type of premise. You know what? So was all three Back to the Future movies for the most part. Doesn't make it a terrible trilogy. Um, the third one I have not seen yet. I will be admitted to that. So I'm kind of comparing two to two here uh, because I have not seen the third Hangover either. However, The Hangover is essentially a no-brainer movie, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I enjoyed it stoned, not so much sober, I'll tell you that right now. (laughs) Taken, however, I don't think I could watch stoned because it would scare me too much because Liam Neeson is a fucking badass. Plain and simple. Done. Okay, pick. I pick The Hangover. 
But, yes. And I tell you why. Because you're a stoner. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> okay. No. Because the third Taken movie was terrible. And See, I haven't seen it, so I can't honestly commit. He at least made a point for the Hangover's third movie where you didn't really... And I, the question is, if you had to watch all three movies in a row and not, not want to blow your brains out by the third movie... I think they You would blow your brains out by the fucking second movie <laughs> right. in the Hangover All right. series. TV round. A lot of people will say the same about Taken. Well, I don't know. Taken, Taken 2 is a solid movie, I thought. Okay. But Television anyway. round. Now I have a little... I'm get, again, I'm going to like a melting categories here. All right. Okay. Of these two TV shows, which TV show best encapsulates the period in which it is set? Boardwalk Empire or Mad Men? Mad Men. It was all about greed. That's a tough one. It, it, you know what? It is a tough one. I'll give you that for sure. Madman. I haven't seen Boardwalk, but damn, I mean, just by looking at it, damn. It, it's a hard one. That really is a hard question. And but I have to go with Mad Men because Mad Men showed you everything there was in that exact environment at that exact time. We had fucking womanizing. We had fucking uh, racism to a degree. Um, we also had rich guys getting richer, no matter how much of a fucking douche they were. Um, you know, we have all of this and we had exactly how cutthroat that industry can be. And especially in that time of age, um, you know, the industry is not, it may still be the same. I'm not familiar with it, but it did get to, it did get to show me exactly how, um, a, the advertising business works and really the advertising business in that, in that time period is where they really started fucking with the consumer. And they showed you that in that series. Okay, uh, definitely it's Boardwalk Empire. You know, it's, uh, it's set a century ago. And the work that has to go into setting it into that time period is more extensive. Now, that's not the fault of Mad Men, but Boardwalk is a more impressive version of a period show. Um, just from the standpoints of how people talked, the way they dress, the demeanor and the attitudes of people is brought forth a lot um, more so. And I just think, you know, from the fact that it is 100 years ago, you notice those differences more. Where with Mad Men, um, it's, it's not that long ago, but I feel like when I'm watching that, I'm watching a completely foreign world. And I can watch other movies and TV shows from that time, and I don't get that same vibe that Mad Men portrays. Mad Men is almost too much outside of what I think it really was. I think it's an exaggerated version of what it was. And I think Boardwalk is a more accurate portrayal. Jody, rebuttal? I don't have one. It's it's Mad Men, in my opinion, did... The question was, what represented that era? And I think Mad Men did represent that exact environment. Neither you nor I were in that environment. Uh, we don't know for sure. Yep. Okay, and you know what? Same thing with Boardwalk Empire, and I will not argue that Boardwalk Empire is a terrible show because it is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but it's... I think that Mad Men really grasped everything that it was, not only character-wise, but also the era. And it really made me, it really brought me into that era, made me think about how cutthroat that that environment was. And the environment and the era go hand in hand, in my opinion. Dave, same thing? Environment and era go hand in hand? Yeah, I just... It's a hard question. It's, it's, it really question. is. Uh, you know, just to me, the, the better period show is, is Boardwalk. Okay, I'm going to have... period show, maybe, but they're, <laughs> both, it... excellent. they're yeah. both excellent shows. They're yeah. both awesome. But the one thing more bad men have been praised for is the characters and the, the, the authenticity of the era. Exactly. Uh, Dylan, what do you... Do you have a point on this, or...? Um, I have not watched for Rock Empire, so my vote goes to Mad Men. Okay. By default, so I mean, I'm I want to watch Boardwalk Empire, but Mad Men does kind of they've got that era down to a T, mm -hmm. especially when they contrast against the episodes where there's a contrast between the um, the you know the high end advertising suits against like the you know counterculture people of the '60s. Mm -hmm. so, you know that is like one of the more interesting aspects of the show in terms of aesthetic dynamic I think I'm gonna I have and I'm not only I'm not giving it because of Dylan and Jim's opinion but I do agree that and it's not because uh, you know Jody had the first rebuttal I just think Mad Men does such a good job of encapsulating the 60s not that Boardwalk Empire doesn't but Boardwalk Empire kind of it, it spans over about like 20 to 
25 years and it really skips over it the jumps whole period. And, and, yeah. and whereas Mad Men is very concise and it's very tight. And they're it, both fantastic. They're both fantastic though and it's really tight. I was actually leaning toward Boardwalk for a while but uh, I have to give it to, to Mad Men. So. All right. Okay, so music. This is another kind of an oddball. This is going to be a hard one. This is another no, oddball question. Um, okay, so you could go back in time. It's 1969. You can only go to one concert. It's either go see Jimi Hendrix or go see The Doors. Which concert do you go see? Hendrix. Okay. I think it was pretty tight. I think Jody got it first. So you have to argue for The Doors. All right. Hendrix, plain and simple. You got to see exactly what my previous argument was. You got to see a a show. You got to see a variation of sound. Mm -hmm in front of you. You got to experience that again, are we experienced. Yeah. He played a lot of the same tracks live, um, you know, and he had the same same three piece mm -hmm. that was uh, happening on the album. Um, it's, you, you can't get a better experience than that. The Doors itself, and again, I, I love The Doors. Um, I think between the two shows, I think it's still gonna be a more enjoyable show to see Hendrix. Do you, to experience all the different variety and style that happened during that show. He, in a way, was, I guess, a, you know, great songwriting, obviously, but he, he told a story with some of the music, whereas some of it was just plain and simple, let's fuck around and see what we get. And I think it's that, it's that variety that would, would, would put me over the line. Did you, Dave? Jim Morrison? And, oh, also, yeah, sorry, oh, just one more yeah. comment. He also picked Hendrix, too. He right. did, he did, but doesn't mean he, uh, he's gonna, you're going to win just because he picked him. No, Hendrix absolutely too. not. Because uh, you know what? He might make a lot of good points for the Doors. I bet he will. He's hey. got that phone out. No, no, no. I, I knew everything about the Doors already. <laughs> uh, come on, baby, light my fire. Yep. What song do you want to see at a concert more than that? I can't think of one. Like, the Doors were the ones who pushed the envelope first. They were the trendsetters. If Jim Morrison had lived past 1971, the world would have been drastically different. Jimi Hendrix, I think, would have faded off. I think he was, he peaked. I think, I, think I, don't, he had, I don't think he had time to get farther off. I don't think Jim Morrison had truly peaked yet. And I, if I had to go see one of those concerts, it would have been his, because I think there was more room to grow. Jim Morrison and not The Doors, eh? That's interesting. Uh, I need, well, Jim Morrison was the lead singer of The Doors. Oh, I'm aware of that. I you need, keep referring to it as Jim Morrison and not The Doors. Okay, I, I, I want to see the whole experience. It is The Doors. I was, it was Jimmy versus Jim here. You gave me a band. You, you was a band versus a, like a solo artist. So. No, 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 no. Jimmy, Jimmy Hendrix was, was in the was band. band. It's the Jimmy Hendrix experience. Okay, okay. And if you, went, if you were in 1970, you could have gotten to see Jimmy Hendrix and the Band of Gypsies, but that would mm -hmm. be a whole different story. That would be a different story. Which I think would be a better show, personally. I, uh, have, I think it might have been. That I've waited my whole life to hear Dave say, come on, baby, light my fire. <laughs> <laughs> um, I need to hear from Dave um, another song other than Light My Fire, what, which would really set the mood at the Doors concert. If you can give me that, he win the point. <laughs> I don't know any more songs. There you go. Problem <laughs> solved. <laughs> All right, Dave, you need to come back here. Music oh, no, is He's not my back. strongest no, subject. Right. He's coming back. Okay. I could, God, God damn it, Jon Snow, you know nothing. <laughs> hey, I know way more about movies and TV than yeah, you probably do. Music so. is this weaker category. <laughs> and, and, and sports, I, I trump you by like a million, so. Electricity. <laughs> <laughs> From now on, every time we think his, his point is mute, we're just going to yell out electricity at him. <laughs> electricity, <laughs> now, shut up, Dave. <laughs> Jody, Jody. We've got a lot of good heckling material this year. Frank. Oh, I hope you're writing it down because I don't have any sort of uh, writing ex instrument right now. Okay, so we'll go to sports now. Um, okay, now here's where Dave takes back his point. You're probably taking back yeah, his point yeah, here, absolutely. but it depends if he says the right thing first, too. I mean, depends what what sport it is. Okay, well, I'll give you a little quick clue right off the bat. It's hockey. Okay, all right, that's good. Okay, equal playing ground. All right, so which Goal was the more golden goal. 1972 or, or 2008? 72. He, he picked 72, so I, I'll take 2008. I see. The question is, which one was the most golden goal? Okay, well, he picked it oh, first, so he was... Goal. Ooh, I didn't, I didn't catch that part. Mm. Canada. <laughs> 
Canada. 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 I'm okay. done with my arguing. Canada. Dave, you were in Canada shirts. <laughs> um, in 2008, we won a gold medal. In, in 1972, there was no medal or cup to be won. So, therefore, the golden gold. But we won fucking pride, and that was worth uh, more than a fucking The 1972. Medal. Um, uh, sorry, what's. Um, Summit Series. Yeah, Summit. the Summit Series. Uh, Paul Henderson. Yeah. Paul Henderson, that is the goal of the century. Yeah. But it was that century, and it was from. That's not how you interpret golden, though. No, and it's not how I interpret golden. Golden is to me is the gold. electricity. See, is the gold medal. It's the Sidney Crosby overtime goal against the United States in the 2008 Olympics uh, was massively huge. It was it, it put Gret, it put Sidney Crosby into Gretzky like uh, persona, even more so than he had been for, before that point. He had won a. a and now he's a bitch. Well, he always was. No, but, that's true. But he became Captain Canada. Like that was like the the torch being passed to Crosby as the leader of the Team Canada, who in hockey own fucking gold medals, and that is why it's the golden goal. And if we talk to anybody who lived prior to that, they will talk about the Summit Series. That's true. But hockey. that's why we're comparing. It is absolutely. And I, as much as I hate to admit it, Dave is correct in a lot of scenarios here. Um, however, the Summit Series is a pinnacle point in hockey, not unlike Dave's point. However, it came first, there was no medal to be won, it was all pride, and it brought the country even more together by watching that. And it was a I have huge it, media success. I have it up on my wall over it's there. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's fucking it's fantastic. <laughs> anyway, I have to give the point to Dave. Really? He's got a picture of it on his fucking I, I, wall, I, I and you're know. giving it to him? He made a lot of good points. That's like the fucking spot question from last week. <laughs> yeah, it's you like, won that. You were the benefit of that. Well, that's true, but I also I also picked Star Trek and not Star Wars like a fucking knob. <laughs> <laughs> and I love Star Wars, yeah. except for the prequels. <laughs> okay, history. History. Uh, I'm guessing wait, wait, what's the score? It, it, you are down one. Jody has five, you have four. Okay. So basically, you have to get this one. If I win this one, I win the game? No. No, you, you tie, tie it, and oh. it goes to a final wild Okay, card. I need but this. But if, if I win this round, you're it's over. fucked. And, I and little, I'm going to yell out electricity. And I have a little, um, what's it, like a... <laughs> the problem is it's I fucking I have something coming for the wild card. That I All right. Think will Ooh, be it's a, I want to play the wild card. Even we're if going straight to the wild card, or are we going history? I, I, I kind of want to do the wild card first, because I think it would be more interesting, and then you guys could really duke it out on the history. If you guys both uh, concede no, to that... No, 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 could, or, no. I, I, I want the history. You want the history? Okay, history. You have to argue who is the more significant United States president, Abraham Lincoln or FDR? Abraham. Lincoln. You say FDR? No, I said Lincoln. I, I heard Dave say it first. You said Lincoln? You said FDR. No, I didn't. <laughs> See, I heard FDR somewhere. I didn't say FDR. All right. Well, Maybe. someone, do you guys have to... It was Jim. Uh, I could have sworn I heard an FDR too, but... I heard an FDR and I heard, I heard an Dave. F I heard an FDR from Jody. I, I never FDR fucking said you. FDR. Fuck it, give me FDR. I don't care. All right, they're both easily arguable. And This is true. Uh, do you want Lincoln? Is that what I'll take you? That's what I picked. Okay, but, yeah, so okay. you go first. Sure. Lincoln. Slaves. Done deal. We're done. <laughs> We're done. He got shot in the fucking head, but look at what he achieved prior to that. Yeah, he started a war. Civil war. Absolutely. And they fucking figured that one out pretty quick, didn't they? No, I'm Five years later. <laughs> Five years later. <laughs> okay, well, in all seriousness, slaves did start a war. Absolutely. However, if we look at the difference between those two presidents, I'm willing to bet, not being an American, nor are you, I'm sure, but... We do have two Americans actually in the line, I believe, yep. which will be nice to get a little bit of their input, I and think. I'm not going to decide till they... Absolutely, and I think that's a good idea. But I think significantly uh, important, and can you just reread the question for me? Because I'm trying to remember exactly how you phrased it. What U.S. president is the most significant to their history, Lincoln or FDR? To their history? So meaning what, their era? Yeah, yeah to, to their overall impact. What they caused, essentially. What, 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 or... Or are you specifically okay. to American history overall? Okay. Okay. Yeah. To to the, the the their impending futures and the, even the world we live in today. Which who was more significant, Lincoln or FDR? That's I mean it's Lincoln it's, for sure. Civil War taught the U.S. a lot of things, and I think that's really what it was all about. It, he was more significant to the American people. FDR was definitely significant. Don't get me wrong, but I think on a more global scale, whereas the U.S. 
benefited more from uh, Lincoln. Okay, FDR? FDR definitely more on the global scale. He was the president during the Great Depression and World War II, who was in president who was president longer than anybody else in history. They actually extended the term limit so he could be president for what four terms, mm-hmm. yep. I believe. Um, and really, you know, the, the, the famous Pearl Harbor speech, the day that will live in infamy. He's also significant. Yeah, four score wasn't important or anything. They were both great speakers. <laughs> they're, they're right both both great orators, but he was president, you know, through having polio and all these things. But in terms of the history, he set up the next, like, what, 40, or probably like 30, 40 years. You know which year he had polio, though? Because the Mario question didn't. No, no. <laughs> okay, listen. FDR... Who was his VP at the end of his presidency? Truman. Truman inherited. And if he hadn't picked Truman, such a terrible vice president, who became the president who dropped the bombs on Japan mm-hmm. and, and basically created the Cold War post um, the Treaty of Versailles, mm-hmm. right? Uh, that set up the Cold War in the next you know, 30, 40 years of what was a very tenuous time that could have ended in global catastrophe with nuclear annihilation. And yes, um, Lincoln was important in his time for what he did for civil rights and how he kind of reshaped the, the United States from, a, you know, like having the idea of it was more of a, a federalist state with all these different states being kind of independent. He brought the more of the national unity together, but um, FDR more significant on a global scale because of the war mm-hmm. he was part of and the time he lived in. And FDR so, sat on his ass. When World War II started. He, so couldn't, he couldn't stand up. <laughs> well, this is, this is actually also true. But I meant more of, obviously, you know what I mean. I don't mean physically. I mean, he sat around and did fuck all while things were happening. Um, and then he eventually got in once they got attacked and got pulled into the war. So let's, let's talk about that. But I think what makes a great president is how they shape their country. Mm-hmm. Yes, FDR definitely did shape his country. Did he shape it to the degree that uh, Lincoln did? I don't think so. Um, you know, it's, it, I think it's, it's important without Lincoln, I, I personally don't think there would have been an FDR in that, in that function. Um, I think he taught number one, I think the, what Lincoln, um, tried to get stood for and what he tried to get changed did affect how things happened later on. And I think you would have a significantly different way. I think FDR personally, yes, later on uh, during the war, once he got into the fucking war, which did take him quite a while, um, you know, obviously very important. Um, but I think to shape a country is what a president does. And that between those two presidents, I think Lincoln shaped it better, plain and simple. Okay. Americans? <laughs> Let's go to the Americans. Which one do I agree with? Sure. Um, I agree with Dave because. Uh, um, Jody argued too much of the slavery angle in the emancipation. But that's an important part of that country's heritage. But it was it, it, Lincoln might have thought it was morally wrong for slavery, but he wasn't necessarily against it either. It's also a myth that the Civil War was just about slavery. It was oh, it wasn't just about slavery. It was about right. a bunch of things. So the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation was also made, but in the Emancipation Proclamation, he stated that any slave that decided to take arms against the South would be free. Yep. He did it to increase the ranks because the Northerners were getting their asses kicked. Yep. It wasn't to necessarily free the slaves. Did it shape the history of the country? But you said slavery. You didn't say... I said a lot of things, but slavery was one of them. Yeah, but (laughs) you, you made it sound like he was for freeing slavery. And the forefathers put certain stipulations within the constitution and even though it says all men are created equal lincoln wasn't for the black man having equal rights as the as a white man so true you know if you would have said his leadership abilities or you know the you know him shaping the company through the country through his leadership but him shaping the country through freeing the slaves had nothing to do with why he made those decisions Okay, and Dylan? It's tough, because I think they both did good, really good things for the country. I can't say both, right? <laughs> <laughs> you could, but, uh, you know, just lean one way, I guess. Uh, not that it's going to matter, but 
It's uh, it will help. <laughs> Wait, what, what you say, Dylan, won't matter. It was yeah. just spew no, something. Well, no, out. him or no, I'm just I'm debating on. I think we already know who won this one. <laughs> JFK one of the choices because I would have right. immediately not picked him. Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we covered that last week, didn't well, we? Well, I picked FDR, but I think FDR has more of um, overall impact, so uh, just as much as Lincoln. So, uh, should we just go to the judge then? All right, the judge. Gonna... All right I'm giving it to FDR. Uh, I think FDR, you know, like we said, how many bullshits have I called? Like, <laughs> you you called a lot of I think every time you don't win the round, you every, call time. It. Oh, <laughs> every time. You know what? It sounds like there might be a pattern there. Yeah. What did you do with the win? What did you do? With I already the won the major round, though. Just remember that. Well, I think that. Wait, okay, I'm gonna explain why. Just because, like, um, you know, overall, FDR, I think, had a more overall impact, lasting impact. He had four terms, and we didn't even talk about. Um, his early terms, which he did a lot to uh, get the country out of the Great Depression. But, well, the um, points I made, four terms. He picked Truman as his VP. He sucked. Yeah, but, you know, Henry Wallace would have been much better. Um, he picked a shitty vice president, and that's the reason why we're praising him. Not okay. praising he, him. He, he wasn't about what was who was the better president. It was about... Wasn't who, it what the question was? What, sorry, more what significant, was more contributed more to the outcome of their era and their time. Yeah. Was what kind of how he phrased it. But this is what I'll say. Lincoln's on the five dollar bill, That's, but Ben Franklin's on the hundred. FDR's on the dime. Ben Franklin wasn't even a president. Exactly. FDR's on the dime. <laughs> he is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go. And he's on the dime. It's like <laughs> more five bucks is better, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's higher. But... Well, and he has way better monument, Lincoln. So yeah. anyway, <laughs> this is what's going to make it interesting. So all right. All right. So for the law card, I kind of there's a little rule you guys have to you know understand. When Wait, I say, are they both tied? Yeah, they're both tied. Going to the last round. I this is a, this is for all the marbles. I think it's for the five five. So just quick rule, you guys have to come up with it's not a one or the other. You guys have to come up with a quick answer answer based on what I say. Now there could be multiple answers to this question, and okay. once you may if you say the same thing, you got to say something else. Now there's okay. So my question is, which movie? Is the best collaboration of Scorsese and DiCaprio? Fuck, that's hard. Wolf of Wall Street. What? Really? Okay. I'm gonna probably in this case go with The Departed. Okay. All right. Wolf of Wall Street versus The Departed. Departed. Both juggernaut movies. Okay. Wolf of Wall Street. The Wolf of fucking Wall Street. That is <laughs> like the the best movie of that year. Like it showed the fuck out of New York. It's a great. Scorsese film. It has all the, the 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 chemistry of what makes him a great director. DiCaprio fucking is out of control in that movie. Um, the panning shots, the uh, the monologues. Margot Robbie, how fucking hot is she? She's an amazing actress to boot, and she she really nailed that part. Um, just just showing that culture, the Wall Street culture, and that 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 could have been. A, as easily uh, a much of a choice of based on a true story as Goodfellas is it's right up there for me with Goodfellas. I watched it just the other day again, and I was like, man, this movie is so fucking watchable. I love Scorsese and the way he takes based on a true story. The Departed, a great film, but it's a fiction. It's borrowed from, uh, I think, a, a Hong Kong film or a Jap It's definitely from Asia. They basically, took, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a Cantonese film that they adapted to an American version, which... It's called... Um... It's uh, Infernal Affairs, Hong Kong film, which is also very good. Which is good, but it, it's a recycled premise. And The Wolf of Wall Street is an original film, and I think it stands apart from almost everything they'd done up until that point. It really brought it to the next level. Wolf of Wall Street. DiCaprio. Jersey. Wolf of Wall Street was three hours, of which two hours were crowd shots yelling. <laughs> Okay, that's really what it was. Now, don't get me wrong. I actually did enjoy the movie. Not that much, but I did enjoy it enough that I continued to watch it. It's drug use and crowds yelling and chanting. That's really what it is. Um, the Departed itself, grimy movie. Sorry? There's a lot of people in this movie. Which one? The Wolf of Wall Street. Oh, yeah, tons of people. Very big cast in that one, yeah. for sure. Um, mm hmm yeah, because the chest bump thing was really fucking fantastic. And Matthew McConaughey, fucking terrible in that movie, okay? 
Let's face it. Okay, and you could honestly jump on. He that. won Best Actor that year. Yeah, not terrible. For, not for that movie. But not for that movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Either way, yes, it was a nice original story. It was. It was neat. It really isn't an original story per se, in my opinion. You have elements of Wall Street in it. You have elements of pretty much any drug movie from the '80s for the most part. Is does that make it a great movie? In my opinion, no. Do I need to go see it again? Hell no. I never need to see that fucking movie again and I will die okay. Departed was a great movie that you can keep revisiting every so often. Yes, you do know the plot at this point, obviously, but and so do you do with Wall Street. Um, but the movie itself, I think Wolf of Wall Street ended up grabbing a lot of, basically borrowed from a lot of other movies previous to it, such as I said, Wolf of uh, sure. sorry, Wall Street and Basically any drug movie from the 80s. Um, <laughs> getting back to The Departed, great ensemble cast, very powerful characters in that movie. That movie, the entire time, like, Matt Dillon in that, fu- I mean, not Matt Dillon, sorry. Yeah. Matt Damon, sorry, excuse me. I have totally two different characters there. Matt Damon. Uh, Damon, yeah. yeah. Matt Damon, remember? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, Matt, Matt Damon, you spend most of the movie thinking, holy fuck, if I actually was in a room with this guy, I would off him. Like, and I'm not a guy that wants to kill people, but I actually fucking hated that guy. That Just fucking hated that character. Mm-hmm. You know, I, Jack Nicholson, obviously, there's nothing to be said about Jack Nicholson. Fantastic, right? Uh, and, of course, Leonardo DiCaprio. And Leonardo DiCaprio in both movies, fantastic, in my opinion. But Departed is a movie that I can go back to. I can go back to every three, four years and enjoy it all over again. Wolf of Wall Street... Chest banging, cheering, and drug use. And once in a while, fuck up a Lamborghini. <laughs> Past that, that's pretty much the entire fucking movie, other than his wife, who's a pain in the ass. The movie itself... But super hot. Oh, super fucking hot. Don't get me wrong. I would not kick her out of bed. Yeah. Okay, but this is, doesn't have anything to do with super hot chick in a fucking movie. This has to do with a good movie. In my opinion, between those two movies, The Departed is a movie that everybody should own in their collection. I do not fucking own Wolf of Wall Street, nor do I have any desire to watch it again. Whereas Departed, I have it on Blu-ray. It's a fucking great movie. Now, DiCaprio's never won an Academy Award. But if, let's say he was nominated against himself. Leonardo DiCaprio nominated for The Wolf of Wall Street or Leonardo DiCaprio uh, nominated for The Departed. Which is a better performance? Oh, by is it DiCaprio. about better actor? Or is it about it's better about movie? The best collaboration between DiCaprio and Scorsese. I think. Okay, my, fair enough. Fair I enough. think my point is valid. Who wins the Oscar? But, uh, you know, if if those are the two performances, Departed, Scorsese won for directing. Sure did. Now he and uh, DiCaprio, he was nominated. So it, and no he, win though. Oh, well, oh, he, he never won. No, he's not going to win. They, they hate him in the yeah. Academy. But was, let's say, was Scorsese uh, nominated for that, though? I don't know. For, what, for Wolf of Wall Street? He I'm was not, nominated. I think, yeah. Was he nominated? Yeah. Okay. But he yeah, won for The Departed. That was his big Definitely won for The Departed, yeah. And, and that is a movie him. that, in my opinion, everybody has. Jim, has should own. I want to hear from you. What do you think? Uh, I think Departed was a much deeper movie, much better movie, better characters, better story. Um, I agree I, with Jim for once. Nice. Out of uh, out of those two specifically, uh, and I see Wolf of Wall Street. Thought it was a great movie, and DiCaprio's performance in it. I mean, he was over the top like he should have been. Definitely and the, over the top. The whole cast and crew on that was great. But um, I have to go with Jody on the. You know, if I ever watch Wolf of Wall Street again, it's because I you know I caught it somewhere. Whereas Departed, I've seen probably over a half a dozen times, and the movie's just phenomenal. And you're still gonna see it again in the future. Oh, I'm sure I will. Exactly. Dylan, what do you think? Um, haven't seen Wolf of Wall Street, but didn't really have much of an interest in seeing it to begin with. Um, saw The Departed for my 16th birthday on uh, that the weekend that was released. God, he makes me feel old. And I remember when I saw the trailer for it, I was in the theater with my dad, and we heard that... Uh, Oh my God! Here we go back to Pink Floyd when there's a song. <laughs> yep. On- it all comes back to Pink Floyd. It's I totally party, forgot about that too, but that's pretty funny. It's into the party, yep. Yeah. Up the wall, um, comfortably numb. Yeah. Got chills. My dad's a big Pink Floyd fan, and he was like, "Great fucking song!" And we were like, "We got to see this movie." And uh, I, I, I really love the. Dep- it's not his best film, but I think no. it's a fucking great film, regardless. Um. And it's something that I can put on from the beginning, from the middle, 
watch the last 20 minutes. It's just a really friggin' great uh, crime uh, epic, and uh, I, I I don't care. And you know what? I think it's different enough from the source material that it uh, it stands on its own. Yeah. Um, and if we're going to go back to an even earlier thing, it's like Jimi Hendrix covering all along the Watchtower. Um, obviously, the Dylan version is fine and great on its own, but the Hendrix version is its own animal. The Departed is its own animal from... Uh, from Infernal Affairs, both are great films, both have their own wonderful merits, but if we're talking about Departed vs. Wolf of Wall Street, I can't really compare the two since I've only seen one, but I didn't really want to see them. All right, then. <laughs> Whatever that part was. All right, I'm ready to make my final decision. I, got, I was getting a, like a, a, a bongo exit. <laughs> that was a pretty good exit. And I think it's pretty unanimous. I think... Jody takes it. I think he, he is This is bullshit! He's there you go, call it! It's bullshit! <laughs> He's earned this victory. Oh, 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 also, 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 Martin Sheen and Alec Baldwin. Damn it's right! Fucking movie with it's true. Yeah, there's a lot of great actors in the part of But you know what, and honestly, when it comes to Wolf of Wall Street, it was a somewhat enjoyable movie, I thought. Yeah. And it was definitely different. And I, I can't honestly say in the last 10 years I've seen a movie quite like that movie. And it's still, it's a great movie. Yeah, I, I, but it's not okay. a movie I need to see it again. I wanted to pick it, uh, but I think overall Departed just... I certainly wasn't bad. picking Aviator because I was fucking... Oh, crazy. Aviator. <laughs> bullshit. That was even more bullshit. I was going to ask you before I made my final decision, what movie is better than Wolf of Wall Street with those two guys? And I think, I guess you'd have to go Gangs of New York. I think Gangs of New York yeah. would be the next No, movie. I like Wolf of Wall Street more than Gangs of no, New York. No, no. I've Wolf seen three of okay, okay. Yeah. I've seen three of these. I haven't seen Gangs or Wolves. I've really? seen Aviator Departed, Shutter Island. Shutter Island was awesome, though. That was a good movie. It was, Shutter Island, yeah. I would have liked better if it was a fucked up prison movie. That's true. <laughs> That's true, actually. <laughs> yeah, if it would have been like the Oz version. Yeah. All right, well. All right, well, Jody is the winner of Woo! the second episode of Trivial Debates. That means they have to have me again. <laughs> That's right. I think you may. one more time. I think you might be due for a hosting. Uh, I have to host next time. Uh, Yo. I, I gotta say, I think you were really um, electric this podcast. Electric. <laughs> really electric, eh? Do you, do you think I harnessed the power, though? <laughs> <laughs> or was it already there? Or was it, it already there? It didn't need to be invented, apparently. Like, do you think I, I, I took it almost to an invention level, or was it just a harnessing <laughs> level? Like, am I, like, Thor the god of fucking thunder, or am I just the guy that happened to harness it? It's Thor. Thoring. It's Thor. It's Thor. Thor. It's Thriller Horror. Thor. Yeah. Thriller Horror. Thor. 1.21 gigawatts. The point is, Dave, you're just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I came this close he to winning. to the second round. I came to this close to winning the whole thing. And I was yelled and at. And to Dave's credit, I, neither I, one of you did. <laughs> And you know what? The lightning thing and the Lemieux thing, you shouldn't have even been considered. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that lightning round? <laughs> I have to admit that Mario thing was bullshit. Fair and I'm gonna call I'm gonna call super double bullshit on that. Well, like, you won the game. What does it matter? Because I would have won it even fucking quicker if it wasn't for if that. Had, if I hadn't won it, a gym would have won. You had the fucking wrong year. And if no, Tim got it, he still literally. No, I did. had. I think we established I had the right year. No, the he gym. had the right year. Well, that's true. He did have the right year. He had the right year. He he made the most compelling case for his Wait, guy. What? He had the right year. Yeah. He would know you did not. About no, what? No. What is your beef? What did I get wrong? You said he only played fifteen games in that playoff. It was in the playoffs. In the playoffs. Okay, I looked at that. That seems right. Yeah. Well, that I didn't. That I couldn't fact check. That I wasn't able to corroborate. But everything else I said, I corroborated. Didn't he get that during the regular season, though? Um, I don't know. Why did we even argue that point if it had nothing to do with the playoffs? Dave had a multiple of points. Jim just had great greatest probably goal of all time, which is hard not to pick it. But um, well, it's a hockey. If night. anything, I thought second to my case was Gretzky most points ever in the play, in the playoffs. In a year, in a single year. Gretzky's you know number is fucking retired league saying, wide. Like he should have got it. Well, so Lemieux should be retired. L Lemieux should be retired, though. I agree. Yeah. Nobody who could wear sixty-six. Like nobody. 
It was it was obviously going to be either one of those two players, I guess. It was. And I would have picked Jaguar. I would have won another way. And I think I would have won that one. Yeah. <laughs> I think we managed to make this podcast longer than the first one. Yeah. yeah. We Even were, though that was not our goal. We were trying to keep it shorter. Yeah. You know what? I blame it on Jim. Yeah. Uh, we shouldn't have ever invited him. Uh, Jim, I blame it on Dave, just like I blame everything. <laughs> <laughs> it was Dave's electric attitude that got us where we were. Good thing I invented that. That was uh, probably the best round. Uh, it probably went on the longest. Um, <laughs> that it did was just... a sparking, sparkling debate. Yeah. So uh, he, really, he really harnessed his point there, though. So audience, make sure to uh, you know subscribe to us on iTunes. I Fuck. wouldn't know why, but we should anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Because you're not, you're, you know, uh, it's a two-hour episode probably again. You can listen to half on the way to work, half on the way home. Uh, what could be better, right? So Harnessing t- electricity could be better. Harnessing electricity. You couldn't listen to it unless we invented electricity. By listening to this podcast, you might be shocked by what you hear. <laughs> oh, all right now for the puns let's uh let's wrap this up uh, fair, enough, fair enough i want to thank our moderator for this episode jeff thank and, you jeff uh well, i'm dave great Ma- questions by the way i'm dave mater i'm jody simpson i'm the moderator jeff mater <laughs> just hit that telephone icon and hang up on those boys <laughs> all right thanks everybody you don't have to go home but you can't stay here <laughs>